when you're emotional or when you're drunk. And of course, being emotional is another way of being drunk. You are drunk on emotion. So, so we have to, if we want to move forward with electoral reform, we have to first define what, what are the real problems um, and what could be the potential problems. The idea that the list has many dead persons, that is a potential problem because we can probably foresee some person may try um, um, something fraudulent. Okay, well, how do we clear the list? We know how to clear a, 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 a list if, they, if it's bloated. Um, what are the issues? The ID card? I mean, the, it goes back to what I'm saying before, what I said before, that I do not know what is what has been the defined problem that warrants this investment of energy, of animosity, of violence. I don't think it exists. I think what we have to do is to continue to seek ways to improve electoral um, process. I mean, somebody waiting in line to vote for three hours plus, that is, I think, is totally absurd. As a matter of fact, a gentleman this morning, I saw him, he walked away. He had waited for a while. He claimed he was losing money, etc., 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 and he walked away. Well, I thought to myself, but gee, oh, it happens once every five years, a very, very big thing, etc. And he walked away because of the process whereby persons had to, the, the instructions had to be read to everybody, each and every person, individually. And the lines were long, long, long. And I'm like, gosh, no, there has to be a better way because if we don't try to fix this, for example, we're going to continue to disenfranchise persons um, unwittingly. So there's work to be done. Yeah. I think most, and, and both parties that appear to me have accepted that, eh, that there's work to be done. They have different views of the work to be done, how the work ought to be done, but both parties have accepted that there's work to be done. And certainly beyond tonight, beyond this weekend, um, well, we have to pull up our seats and get down to work on on this matter. Let, let me oh, oh, invite you, but let me just share some information, some some data um, that um, if we were to zero on the bloated list, uh, let's just um, spend some time discussing the, the bloated list. Um, if we if we look back to 1980, where we had our first general election as a, as an independent nation, um, the list of electors was around 30,000. Uh, registered voters. At that time, our population was just bothering at around 73,000 um, individuals. We see that list has grown through the 1985 um, by 41, there about 1,000 um, voters. By the time we reach in the 90s, it grew to um, 51,000 registered voters. But an interesting thing happened. Um, by the time we were in the mid-90s, or in the beginning of the of, of, um, 1990s, that decade, our population started to decrease. Mm. And I think we had reached, by the time we reached 1995, we had a population of the about 67 to 68,000 individuals. However, our oh, list of registered yeah. voters were Australia? up to around 50 something. 57 in 1995, it was 57,632 voters. Mm -hmm. 2000, it was 60,266 voters. 2005, it was 60, 65,889 voters. 2009, it was 67,223 voters. And I'm trying to lay my hands on the 2014, it was 72,533. Yeah, and, and our so, effective uh, population yeah, so. only crest around 80,000 yeah. in the mid-90s thereabout. So there is concern about the bloated list. But there is another piece of statistic that I would like to share so that we can have some further discussion and analysis on the whole issue. In the, in the, um, since the, the banana, um, the green gold, Days and the decline in the banana industry, we see that we had the out migration happening significantly, where we had many of our registered voters corresponding with that increase in registration. Mm. And um, what I may may assume here is that whereas the the age at which individuals used to register before, especially in the 80s, the 70s, the 80s they would register at later ages. I know persons who register after they turn 25. We had a situations where individuals upon turning 18 
was being registered because you had the political parties, both the DLP, the U mm. UWP, more aggressively um, registering um, young voters. Mm. So we had an increase. But these very young voters, and many of them with the increasing individuals moving for educational purposes and not returning, so we had the brain drain. And also we had individuals who were displaced by the banana industry also moving for, for, for better economic opportunities. And to the point where our data will show that almost 22 on 1,000 individuals were living in 2000 at the time. By the time now, what we have observed is that currently around 5 in 1,000 is actually living in Dominica. So with this kind of thing, can we, can we have some discussions in terms of the demographics and how do we address that bloated list vis-a-vis -vis the, the call for electoral reform in terms of reforming the laws that addresses the, the um, um, voters in the diaspora? Mm. It, it is, uh, let me just say, I, I myself, um, based on research I've done, I do not use that term bloated list at all, you know, because um, it, it, it conveys a certain impression of you know, inaccuracy, which to some extent from my research I've found, you know, it, it, it borders on kind of misinformation, you know, because the law contains a procedure whereby persons who are deceased can be removed from the list. If, if, if the, and that fundamentally a collaboration between the registry and the electoral office. And I understand there is collaboration between the, between the two of them. Once a person dies in Dominica, the information is then made available to the electoral office so the name can be removed when there's a death certificate and so on. If the person dies outside of Dominica though, the electoral office may not be aware of that or the registry may not be aware of it. So then the onus then becomes on the family members to make that information available. You know? And the other thing is that if somebody is, for whatever reason, their name is on the list, but they shouldn't be on the list, mm. then there's a process of objections, which, if it is followed, will allow that person's name to come out of the list. So the thing is that, so the, I believe we have a system and we have the legislation to deal with this matter. Mm. Of course, we may want to modernize the legislation. We might want to um, tweak the system, you know, bearing in mind um, other systems around the world, I mentioned the absentee ballot, for example, but there are other characteristics you want to talk about, you know, to, to, to make the, to bring it up to the 21st century. So this is the kind of thing. But, that, that, you know, that is how I, that's how I see it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other <coughs> Yeah, well, well, well um, you mentioned diaspora voting. Diaspora voting is very important. Um, um, to us, uh, especially at this election, we have seen the diasporans if I could use that term, engaged at a level that we haven't seen before. That's one important, um, to me, one important um, difference between this election and previous elections is the level to which the parties have engaged them um, openly before it was said that, you know, well, Lex Leader met this group in, you know, wherever, in the Bronx or wherever, or wherever that may be. But this time around, we actually, it was in full view. We are both the parties actually engage them. The thing about diaspora and voting, you do not want to disenfranchise persons who, for one reason or the other, have left Dominica, but who have who continue to maintain ties with Dominica. But that's, once you open up the diaspora and vote, then you be, it becomes a little more difficult as to how do you engage them. Once a person say, well, you cannot transport persons, you can transport persons in Dominica, but you can't transport them via air, um, airplanes because I do not know why, but um, because you just can't do it. Um, then some persons say, well, look, there's either absentee ballot. Some persons would have mentioned as well the idea of um, electronic voting. Um, but to get somebody to vote, you have to engage a person to know what it is that the person actually wants. And I find in my conversations with many persons who do not reside in Dominica, they often, they often have a, a very warped image of what Dominica really and truly is. Because it seems to me they're either being fed from one media direction or the other. And when they speak to you, you realize but this person has really and truly been paying attention. But what he or she is saying might not be totally um, a, a balanced picture, reality. a balanced picture of what reality is. So, if you're going to open up, you're going to institute measures to allow to facilitate diaspora voting.
you're going to institutionalize diaspora and vote. You have to look at how do we engage diaspora so that the diaspora and the voter is an informed voter. One key element of democracy is that the voter is an informed voter. That's why it's, you know, there's so much pressure on the media to bring out very important and clear information to the, to the voter. So if you're going to institute measures to facilitate the diaspora and vote, we also have to look at how it is that we engage with diasporans so that they get, you know, informed, so they're really informed and they're truly in, uh, um, engaged if they still desire well, in the process. I don't know what engage and inform because the diasporans are already voting. So it's mm -hmm. not um, a thing that it is a new case we are studying. The diasporans are, are, have been voting in elections maybe from 80s to the uh, Definitely by 1995, the diaspora yes, was voting until now. Yes, they are. And yeah. so the, the question becomes, and so it, there's always this, this the, the, I think the issue the diaspora is voting that came about is not that diasporans cannot vote or how do we engage them. I don't even think that is the issue persons have about engaging the diasporans. The question becomes, should they vote? Because they, we go back to the law that says if you're out for five years, you, you shouldn't vote. Or, or let's say should. It said may be removed. Mm -hmm. May is not a must. Yeah. You understand? So the may means that there's a process, and that is why there's a process. And the question we, that has to be asked is what is the process if, if someone is out for five years of getting them out? And who institutes this process? Or have you tried to institute that process and then it failed? But until that is done, a person remains on that list. And, until, and any person who is on that list is eligible to vote irrespective of where you reside or where you are. And the, the question I think we have to ask and in, in a bigger way, and that I think it has to be a discussion, maybe nationwide, and especially now that it has hit us all over the, 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 the place, is should a Dominican retain the right to vote irrespective of where they live or how long they've been away? We will bring out the point of the Americans. Americans can vote anywhere they are. They don't even have to go back to America to vote. They can vote. Although we know, yes, there may be some issues with that system. They can vote. I have always maintained for myself personally, I said to persons I've lived several places outside of Dominica, I've been entitled to vote in St. Kitts, in England, in Barbados. And I have never exercised that right to vote in any of these countries. And my as a, is, as a Commonwealth citizen. As a co yes, I can. Because in England, actually, they, they come to your doors. Right. When I went to do my master's, within a month, somebody was at my, in my room knocking and saying, they've come to register me. And I'm like, no. They're like, yeah, you're entitled to vote. And we, we went from the system they had from immigration, they got my record. It shows you'll be in England for more than a year. Mm. Consequently, you are. And there's an election due it was the next year. And I said, no, I'm not registered to vote. I'm not from England, and I'm not going to, to vote. Well, well I, I went to my PhD. As well, uh, I, I did not know that I voted in Barbados as a colonel. Yes, you, know, you can, once you stay country, there. But the reason that I don't vote, I choose. I said, no, this, I'm not there. The only place I was born is in Dominica, and that's where. And that's why I said, no one can take away that right from me. A, Whether I live a... out of Dominica for moon years, mm -hmm. I remain a Dominican, and I am entitled to vote. But and there's, I, um, the, yes. there's, a, there's an argument that um, whereas we're looking at according to the, to the law that once you are physically um, non-resident in the country for five years yes, you may. that you are likely to be deregistered. Mm -hmm. um, there's the opposite argument um, that there should be no such limitation. Um, so what's your views on this? Oh, well, I just, I, well, well, what, what I'm not giving you again, Dr. Yes. Henry, what I'm saying, I think there's, there needs to be more national discussion on yeah. that. <laughs> I, and, you know, in a very structured way so that Maybe we might even need a referendum on it. You know, I, I think tell. so. I honestly you know, do. So it's what do you think? people are dividing on it. Well, well, I, I mean, I don't want to prejudice the... the, the, the no, the, but that's you know, where you have your party. Yeah. It's not prejudice. Well, I would, you would, have, you would have your opinion on that. Yeah, my opinion, I'd go along with Dr. Henry, but if I was to be involved in that discussion as a, as a citizen, I would mm -hmm. try to ensure that the listening audience understands the issues because yeah. you would, some people would be in favor, some would be opposed. My focus would be to help to reach some kind of consensus that um, we can take forward as a, as, a, as, a, as a society, even if my own personal opinion may be otherwise. Yeah, my vote would be for, that is to maintain the person on the register. The, 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 the right to vote is so, in my mind, so sacred 
that once you uh, once you attain the, the age, the legal age of voting, that is something that you carry with you uh, up to the grave. And whether you reside in Dominica or not, to me you have the right to vote. You know, we can discuss how do you vote, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I and I personally, I, that's why I mentioned going going beyond just the diaspora and voting, but also how do we engage the diaspora? Because I think we have to begin to look at that as well. It's not just simply, you know, um, okay, they're voting, so how do we make them vote? Because, um, you know, an uninformed voter, I'm not so sure. I mean, but the uninformed voter is not just for the diaspora. We can talk about uninformed voters that's true, right that's true. in, in Dominica. Because yeah, yeah. when you speak to certain persons and you ask them, they don't know even why they're voting, why they're voting. Mm. You know, because just like, you know, my little boy was having a discussion with him because he, had cho he has chosen his side. And he was saying to me, he, that was who he was voting, I won't declare who, because um, one of his aunts um, supports. And I was like, no, you can't choose a party because someone else. Give me your own reason why you decide that's why he can't vote, of course, why you were voting. And then, he voted, and then he gave me some his reasons that were rational for a 10-year-old. And, 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 but I, there are lots of persons, and we know it, diasporans as well as non-diasporans. Who vote without no thinking process? So can I ask you a know? question to, to you, the panelists, and um, for the public's um, More digestion? Are coming. Um, is it a situation where um, we have left the whole electoral process and the whole um, business of elections, have we left it up to political parties rather than it is a responsibility of civil society and maybe to an extent a greater responsibility on the part of the commission? Very good question. That's a good question. And, and let us take the results. We'll come back to that while we, while we put together our response. Because you have some new results. And I know persons are looking. So far, the results for the two constituencies we have yes, are, so in far. fact, in line with what and expectations. Yes. Salisbury with um, Hector John leading the poll, United Workers Party, right. and Portsmouth, although it's one so far, with Ian Douglas from Dominican Labour Party leading the polls. So far, so far. Um, falling in line with expectations. Yes, yes but we have no results. Oh, I forgot oh, to yes. Sorry. Yes. Okay, yes. so let's go back mm -hmm. to the question. Just, that was a very good question. So, so we're discussing, you know, yeah. what, what, what role and what responsibilities do we see from civil society, whether it is a, a responsibility we, we have to amp up with the Electoral Commission, because there seems to be the going um, um, practice that political parties which emerge over the years, they are the ones who take in the whole blunt for the responsibility of actually educating and, and um, making the, the, the general public and the voting population aware of the elections. Yeah, well, pol political parties will logically be involved in educating their, their, their supporters, right? Yes. Um, however, for us, the, 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 the entity responsible for electoral reform is the commission. The, the executive, that is the cabinet and, and PM, would provide the, the resources, the financial resources, but it's the commission that does the legwork. Now, the commission can engage a civil society. Um, and I would totally be in support of a situation whereby the commission works hand in hand with a civil society that is active. And I'm, I'm, I'm using these terms because I'm, I'm speaking in a context where I've observed in the past year. I mean, I, I often ask myself, where are our institutions? Are they functioning? The civil society, the role of civil society, I would imagine in this electoral, um, the whole cry for electoral reform would have been, should have been, sorry, to, to, to put together, well, a very factual position, sit with the commission and look at how we can truly advance the process. Um, I did not see that in this, um, in this during this campaign, and um, and so I was a little disappointed there. But but really and truly, I, I would I would like to see a situation where the civil society works more closely with the commission, that is the institution mm -hmm. established for that purpose, um, to advance electoral reform. If we agree that electoral reform is the way to go, but I. I at this point, I want to just um, introduce uh, Mr. Julian Morris mm. of um, Smith Mapping. Mm. Yes. Yeah, Ju Mr. Julian Morris is also um, part and of this broadcast. And um, 
we will also continue um, in sharing some of the results that is coming through. So let us just go across to Julian. And nothing on that screen. Nothing on there. Yes, lost it there. I want to do some kind of might be on that there. No, you, wait, if you want to jump in, it's okay. No? This is, is happening live. Yeah, this is not on. It is not on. It, it, it's on, but it's on. Okay, right. Yeah. It's on. The lights are yeah, on. It, it, okay, it is on, but the but the, the screen is blank. Yeah. The product is on. Good evening. In PBS Radio, I say this because we are collaborating basically in bringing you the results of the 2019 uh, general uh, election elections and um, of course uh, the viewers of uh, GIS as well. Uh, we have some results here for you. We're a little behind but uh, Sufre uh, T01, that's um, polling station T012, that's the, that's the uh, primary school there. Um, we have uh, the Sam Christian of the United Workers Party 34, uh, Denise Charles uh, 130. Polling station T025, uh, that is uh, the village council. Uh, surnames F to M. You have uh, Sam Christian 57 and Denise Charles 153. Polling station T04, T0411, uh, that's at the Port Michel uh, Resource Center uh, with surnames O to Z72, Sam Christian of the uh, United Workers Party and 124, Denise Charles of the DLP. We do have uh, some results as well coming in from uh, Portsmouth uh, in uh, polling station LO37, A to D, the RDPS, uh, Jefferson James 41 to 128 for Ian Douglas. In uh, Salisbury, Salisbury, uh, polling station QO37, K2R at the Gospel Hall, Hector John 100, Nichols Esprit 17. Polling station QO38 on the surnames S to Z at the Gospel Hall, the same, the same place. Hector John 112 and Nichols Esprit 31. Uh, apologies again for coming in late with some of these uh, results. There were some uh, challenges earlier on. We, as I said, we were receiving results, but it was not specific as to which polling station these results were coming from that had to be clarified as well. So we will continue uh, throughout the broadcast bringing you updates as we receive them. Okay, just to do a, a quick rundown, a repeat of the results that we have so far from the Sufria. Uh, polling station T012, Scott's Head, Primary School, Sam Christian 34, Dennis Charles 130. Polling station T025, that's at the uh, Village Council. On the surnames F to M, you have Sam Christian 57 and uh, 153 for Dennis Charles of the DLP. T0411, that's the uh, Point Pechel Resource Center on the surname zero to Z, 72 Sam Christian, and 124 Denise Charles. Move on to Portsmouth, LO37, A to D, RDPS, 41 Jefferson James, 128 Ian Douglas. Move on to Salisbury, Q0411, 
Q037 last surname's uh, K to K to R at the Gospel Hall Hector John 100 Nichols Esprit 17 at the same locations in Gospel Hall uh, Q038 on the names surname's S to Z Hector John 112 Nichols Esprit 31 that's the the those are the results we have so far uh, that is not to say that um, we're not hearing a lot of unofficial, uh, you know how this happens, there's a lot of unofficial uh, results coming in, but that we, we cannot give that to you. We want to give you, uh, you know, what we're receiving here at the electoral office. So uh, we will come back later on with the updates as we receive them. Yes, um, as we continue the discussion, um, we have just heard from Mr. Morris um, some of the um, results that has emerged. Um, over the next couple of minutes, I guess mm -hmm. things will start flowing in, in earnest. Mm -hmm. um, but we were discussing the whole idea of civil society participation in the mm -hmm. whole electoral process. In mm -hmm. other words, um, it, it, things seem to be left to an election. When an election is due, suddenly everybody gets busy. How can we change even that process? Uh, I think we have to go so much beyond this. I think it has to go back to a, a curriculum in school, civics. I mean, years ago, civics has been taught, and even you know, now it's social studies. But I think we need to either reintroduce civics or reintroduce this electoral or role as electors back into this curriculum so that it begins from early. So they say early education is the foundation. I think that is where we need to go back, the foundation. And then, of course, augmented by civil society, augmented by the work of the Electoral Commission throughout in terms of education and training. I mean, it's not just during an election year, but throughout the course of the, of the year, maybe once a year, twice a year, Electoral Commission can go out on an outreach. Um, to, because that is their key responsibility, to, to manage the elections and to ensure it's free and fair. And as you said, we, we, we know what we're voting for. And of course, political parties will always have a stake in educating uh, uh, or in getting votes. Um, and that stake has always been there and will always be there. And so, but I think we, in order to address that, in order to get, as, you, as Gerald has been talking about, Dr. Amshar Jack, more informed um, voters, it has to start from beyond, mm -hmm. from the school, and then augmented at our homes, and, and having more of an open discussion. One of the things that has saddened me, especially, and it has been heightened in this electoral um, season, is the lack of tolerance for differing views and opposing views. We can no longer have an open discussion about my way and your way. And you know, so we expect everybody to follow my way, and no. And, and it's, it's that discussion, it's that engagement, when persons can critically analyze and critically discuss things, then we're going to have more informed voters. Then we're going to have, you know, let us say, you know, better governance too, because if we are more informed, we're also going to demand more from the, the, our government. And so it, it, it is something that is just not to wait for election or just relegate it to the two main persons who we think with the responsibilities, but I think we need to go much more, much beyond um, those. Yes. Uh, it is, um, over the period of um, the past um, weeks, uh, has there any been any observations that would allude to definitely, what evidence do we have to say definitely that have eroded? She has mentioned the, the lack of tolerance in opposing viewpoints. Um, individuals' in, inability to express themselves without being attacked. Um, what, what exactly is going on? What, what, what do you think is, is creating that, that kind of divide? Um, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to say this, and I'm going to, I, I, at the risk of sounding controversial, the electoral reform issue, the way it has been handled, and if you look at the way it has been handled, it clearly is a strategy, it has been a strategy to gain office. It hasn't been, it hasn't emerged as a genuine policy issue where there is a problem that we are trying to fix. And that's what you have when you let political parties take on an issue like yeah, electoral point, reform. They are going to promote this as, in a manner, package it and promote it in a manner that is going to whip up 
the sentiments of their supporters because they're going to say something, and it happens also in Dominica. If you listen to, um, I think I was listening to this gentleman, I can see his face still in um, England, and there was this similar issue of. Um, what does that um, Brexit? Right well, it was about, I think then it was about Brexit. Then it was about Brexit. But the way he was selling this, whatever he was saying then was, they are out for us and therefore we ought to keep our eyes on them. So it's a they against them. Yeah. Politicians do that. And that is what you have in Dominica when we allow, uh, when the commission, and I have been very critical of the commission, not openly, but very privately, when you sit back and you allow the executive to take the flak, push the executive forward, when in, really, in reality, that is your job, electoral reform process. Really, that is your thing. You are the institution set up for that. So, um, to go back to your question about the emotion, how is it that we have become so... Well, because it has been a strategy to gain power. And let me explain what the strategy is. The strategy is, if you can convince persons that that list is bloated and it is deliberately kept bloated, so as to um, rig an election, so as to steal an election. Now in Dominica, vole is something that is a big bad thing, among other things. Call somebody a vole or some other bad thing along this line, and that's a big thing. So when you accuse somebody of vole in an election, when you tell somebody, this guy wants to vole in an election, that's why they want to keep that list booted. You're going to throw up um, sentiments. And in politics, political behavior, fear, and anger. These are two sentiments. If you want to be a good propagandist, these are two very sentiments that you need to have on your side. And therefore, these, the agenda, the, the, the electoral reform strategy has been infused with emotion. And if you go back, you don't have to take my word for it, you go back so since 2008 when the United Workers Party started clamoring for electoral reform, you will look at the period in which it coincided. That was a period in time when they were, they were losing some of the court uh, matters, some court petitions. Um, and then it appeared to them that they had no way out. They, were not, they had not won the election in 2005. And it seemed that they were not winning the court battles. So they had to come up with something. Electoral reform is a very nice, noble idea. But left to the political parties, as we saw in Dominica, they're going to use this, spin it, package it, and sell it as an us against them. When you have that mix, yeah, many persons were very irate, and many persons have bought into this electoral reform agenda and they are convinced that somebody is out to steal their vote. Are we responsible to share with the general public the what? issue of um, the makeup of government? What type of government system do we have? How do, how, do we, how do we allow the public now that we have come to the climax of, of this election cycle? How do we start preparing ourselves? What are some of the tenants of the things that I would like you as panelists to, to really ticker to the public in terms of what are the specific actions that you believe we should take to help to advance the process so that at the end of the day we don't find ourselves, as you mentioned, since 2008, but this is 2019, yeah. and we are going into the election cycle of 2025. What do we do? I, I, I was speaking, I had the conversation with some persons, and, and what I, I want to say is, I'm going to be very, very brief on this, because I think, I think the way for us to begin, as of next week, is to start having some, a national discussion, because there are persons who genuinely believe that some persons are out to do them bad. So let's have a frank, honest, France had a, a national debate, um, not after this round of yellow veg protests, but the previous round of protests. Mr. Macron then had a, a, a di national dialogue. We need national dialogue, and I and I and I'm I have been thinking about this, and I'm willing to begin to work so we can sit down and have a national dialogue. We are persons with the grievances. They can bring them out. And what you're going to have, what I hope will come from that, 
is persons can begin to understand how the process works. And it has to be in such a manner that all and sundry are allowed to participate. The man who hasn't, doesn't have a CXE subject, as well as a person who has X number of PhDs. Okay? That, I believe, is one starting point. The rest, well, my colleagues may have some other ideas. Yes, sir. Um, yeah. Doc? Well, you see, the thing, see, what I'm concerned about is that, um, you know, some people, at the end of the day, Dominica is a small island developing state, and the, getting the economy to perform close to its potential you know, it takes a lot of time, energy, um, you know, um, management skill, you know, um, the, the, your link with the outside world, investors, financial institutions, and so on. And, yeah. and you, if you're not careful, you can get yourself, you know, distracted in a number of areas that will um, minimize the amount of attention you have to give to your priorities. So I take the point you're making um, that um, one has to deal with those matters so that they do not continue to occupy such, such center stage. Because really, um, the, these things really are, are really a means to an end. They, they don't end. It, they don't end themselves. And I believe that um, um, we are we are we are not, we are on a, on a path now where we're moving more and more into the services sector, so like through the tourism tourism arena, and um, that is highly competitive. Whereas bananas was was very uh, you know protected. Remember, we were talking pre WTO when we were very sheltered. And we really made a lot of progress in that arena. And we enter in this new arena. It looks very attractive and, and very um, um, in a way that we can raise the standard of living for people. But it is much more competitive, and therefore standards and efficiency and you know, and 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 and, and, and issues of that nature will become much more center stage, um, value for money and things of that nature. So it's important that we, we get this matter behind us. And what you've suggested is just as good an approach and what Dr. Henry um, has suggested also, so that um, this becomes a non-issue going forward. I think that's the kind of thing we're talking about. I mean, with respect to the Electoral Commission, um, 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 is, there, is there need for some reform of that body? Is there need? I'm not saying there is. I'm just saying that. Which body? Um, the, 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 the commission. The, yeah, the commission. Oh, okay. I'm just asking the question. Because as you know, with the passage of time, you need to modernize, you need to um, bring in best practice. It's something we, that sometimes you have to do a certain amount of introspection. But at the end of the day, um, we have to be concerned about ensuring that our society is moving forward in line with its capacity to generate income, wealth, and the standard of living for the, for the majority of the people of our country. That has to be, uh, must continue to occupy our attention and, 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 and not allow other matters, important as they are, to distract us. So we should deal with them in a very professional way and more results-oriented way, mm -hmm. so that um, we can get on with the with the um, business of the quality of life and the standard of living for the majority of the Dominican people. Um, Doc, um, as you were going to to, um, to share on, on on the same issue, I just want for us to extend because, as he indicated, what are the priority in terms of the focus? But having had electoral reform dominate the focus in, in this election cycle, and considering the fact that we still have the priority in terms of our economic development, so where do we see our economy going that gives us the backbone to sustain the kind of, of, of reforms that, that we are suggesting here? To what extent um, in the post-election um, period um, those whatever we, we channeled or we championed a while ago in terms of pursuing an urgent agenda for electoral reform, not going to create some sort of distraction and, and some retrogression in terms of what are the priorities for our country development right now. What would you share on this? Indeed, in fact, I, I kind of share some of um, Dr. Douglas's view. But what I, my first response was, it's why electoral reform dominated, especially in the large, larger part. It's not the only issue that has created this division, that's created this um, kind of an anger. There's an anger in Dominica that whoever wins this election mm -hmm. has a lot of work to do. And Dr. Jean-Jacques talked about a national dialogue. But even before we can get to a national dialogue, we have to get to a place where we can rebuild trust. We have to get to a place where we can expect because as he said that people are out to get me but we are all working towards the best interest 
And that is where we have to begin to look at other things. What are some of the other areas? I mean, in terms of the unemployment, in terms of the job opportunities, in terms of the, 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 the participation of persons in not just in the, in the economy itself. And Dr. Douglas talked about tourism being more service oriented. We know there has been an issue where um, a segment of our professionals have been arguing about the procurement and how the process is done, where to a large extent certain businesses and business persons feel they are left out of bidding processes, they are left out of opportunities for their own growth of their business and consequently um, their own personal growth and development. So we have to really begin to examine those issues. What are the factors? What are the factors affecting this nation? And how do we begin to address them? Mm -hmm. So electoral reform is key. And in the, in the last part, it really took on a life of its own that almost sent us to a place that most of us didn't recognize or do not want to go to. Mm -hmm. But there are other issues, other embedded issues, where to a large extent, persons also feel that wealth and, 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 and the opportunities are for one set and it doesn't filter through. How do we ensure that our system becomes more equal where everybody gets a chance to participate in the economy, in the process, and to get, and to earn, not just get. I think we have spent too much time getting, but to earn their own piece of the pie. And I think that's where we need to begin to take the discussion and the work going forward. So at this moment, we're going to um, go back to um, uh, Julian Morris, who is going to give us some results that's coming in at this moment as we continue the discussion. Julian? Okay, we have some additional results for you that we should relay to you. Sufre, we're going straight to uh, polling station T037, A to J, uh, St. Luke's Primary School, some Christian 75, Dennis Charles 90. We go over to Wesley, V025, last name is A to D, Wesley Primary, Ezekiel Basil 75, and Fidel Grant 89. V026, E to L, Wesley Primary, Ezekiel Basil 62, and Fidel Grant 73. Let's uh, skip over to Portsmouth, LO39, LO39. L to P, Roosevelt Douglas Primary, Jefferson James 25, Ian Douglas 108. L0310, Q to Z, Roosevelt Douglas Primary, 33 and 130. 33 for Jefferson James, sorry, and Ian Douglas 113. Let's over to Maho, polling station F039, A to D, that's at the Maho Community Center. Uh, Felix Thomas, 62, 62, and uh, Ribbon Blackmore, 104, 104. FO311, K to Q, the, Maho, the same place, Maho Community uh, Center, uh, Felix Thomas, 41, 41, and Ribbon Blackmore, 76, 76. Now, this is happening real fast and furious. I assure you it is fast and furious because while we're in here at Electoral Office, we, we're getting information coming in about, you know, on the ground, what's happening in the, con in the constituencies. And so far, what we have rec received, it seems from the information that we have, this is unofficial, but I just received a list uh, from a very good source here that uh, the DLP uh, may have um, made headway in a number of constituencies already. And I'm going to name them, but I remind you carefully that this is, it is not of official. So the list I have, you have um, Rosa Central, you have Colliho, you have Sufre, uh, Cottage, uh, Vicas, Pidet Savan, uh, Paybush, St. Joseph, Portsmouth, uh, Salibia, uh, Wesley, uh, Grand Four, and La Plaine. I repeat, this is not official results, but what I have received from this um, source is that um, this is the direction that these uh, preliminarily, this is the direction that these seats are going. And I, I just emphasize how quickly this is, all, this is all happening. Very often, those of us at the electoral office, and you know this of you who have followed the broadcast over the years, we are, tend to be a little behind the people outside there. So this is basically what we have for now. We'll be back with you when we have another update.
Yes, so we have heard um, from Julian Morris um, the latest on, on the um, results. Um, he has given some unofficial results in terms of um, seats. But we're going to continue the discussion and um, we um, really want to um, analyze um, elections and uh, analyze post-elections also what, what really is necessary as we see uh, a new government being formed, a new mm -hmm. government being installed. Um, what do you see as the priorities um, really for a new government in the next five years? Number one has to be governance. Going forward, the governance framework of the, of the country has to be enhanced. As the OECD says, and it says that the governance of, of a, a country is determined by the governance of the government. And a lot of the stories and the accusations and maybe some of the evidence kind of lead to the fact that maybe there needs to be greater transparency in the governing and the governance of our country. That has to be a priority going forward. Employment, job creation and employment for the youth has to be another priority. Um, our education system, I mean, we, I think we're doing relatively well on education in terms of the great opportunities that have been provided for, children, for young people, especially in terms of um, higher education. And that has to continue. The health, I think we have to pay greater attention to health. While, yes, I know we, the PMH is being, you know, we are getting a brand new hospital. But it's not just about a brand new hospital. It's ensuring that we have functioning things, ensuring that the, our, our, this, this, this service um, element to it. So the health of our nation, the health and, and being able to, that every time we have an issue, a major issue, somebody doesn't have to be flown out for that. I think NHI is a, is, it has to come back on the agenda of a government, mm -hmm. the National Health Insurance. That has been toyed with in Dominica from the 85 under Miss Charles. Started off, it languished. UWP started it again, came back, it languished. The mm -hmm. Labour Party government, when Mr. Fabian was um, the Minister of Health, that was back on the front burner. In fact, there was almost a secretariat established for that somehow that has disappeared again. Mm. But it is critical because too often we have too many petitions going around when if we had NHI and a, a properly structured NHI, we could have taken care of that. In terms of even our industry, agro-processing. Agro I, I, I have been saying that for years. Mm. Agro-processing has to come as a big agenda item. While, yes, we may not be getting any much money from our own bananas, the raw material is not where the wealth is. It's not where the, the, the growth is. Mm -hmm. We have so, I mean, you go to our shelves, you see juices from Barbados coming crying out loud. Mm -hmm. When Dominica is the one, we have all of these fruit trees and these fruits wasting and rotting. Mm -hmm. We don't have any agro-processing. We talk about bananas. We still have bananas. Well, yes, our market has declined for bananas, planting, dashing, and so on. We could go into so many things. Banana flour. Yes, you have some people doing that on cottage industry. But that, it has to be beyond that. And those are some of the areas I think government has to invest. A water plant. I mean, on Dawasco into water should be a priority going forward. So those, I mean, there are some priority areas that I think that the government, and I, I mean a government cannot do everything. So a government has to determine what it is. There you, you brainstorm and you come up with eight, nine, ten things. But out of this eight, nine, ten, in this next five years, it's not two part two everywhere, it's not two hour in everywhere. Eight, nine, for the next five years, where are the three priority areas of four that we are going to devote ourselves to so that by the end of that five years, we can show a world class something. Because otherwise, we will be here 30 years down the road, and we will be looking. Yes, we will see some evidence, but we won't be able to hold things tangibly mm. to say this is it. We won't be able to feel it. And we, it has to give. And so that has to be a strategy. And government, and it does have to be honest with the people. More dialogue. This is it. You can even engage them to determine what the priority areas are. 
but we have to begin to focus on priority areas for the enhancement and the improvement of the life of all Dominicans, not just a segment of our population, but all Dominicans must feel that growth, must feel that, and there must be a sense of hope. Because you go through the tongue, and you, and you talk to young people, you talk to even older people, you talk to even people my age, and, and you, you get a sense of almost despair going forward now in the next so whoever forms the government. We have to begin to fuel an injection of hope, which can only come for growth and for persons actively participating in the economic life of the country. Okay. Well, well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I hear what Dr. Henry is saying, but um, I have a, a slightly different perspective, you know. But yes. one thing I would like to say, I mean, we have, hopefully, we have two manifestos to start with. The DLP have its manifesto. Well, we have none. The UWP has a manifesto. Why is it? The, the, well, we have, we have well, none. This I mean, we may not have it here. We may not have it here. Sure. Physically here, but they are, in fact, available, you know. Mm -hmm. So one would, one would expect that... Um, there's material in there that one can use going forward. Not because if the DLP wins, it shouldn't show on the UWP manifesto. Similarly, if the UWP wins, it shouldn't show on the DLP manifesto. But you have all these ideas that can help push Dominica forward. So that would be one starting point. Secondly, in terms of, um, in terms of agriculture... So you have a national manifesto. Right, fair enough. <laughs> we don't want to be looking at it, really, because, you know, I mean, the election is over. You have two major documents from the two main political parties, you know, oh, who contested all the seats. The question is, what can you get from both of them that you can use going forward? I mean, that, 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 I don't think anything wrong with that. I don't, because, that would know, be perfect. That would say that should show a level of maturity, which is where we need to get going. That is yeah. perfect. And hopefully you will get more sort of buy-in from those who didn't support whoever won the party, because some of the ideas, some of the aspirations would be incorporated going forward. Um, Okay, so that's, you, you want to say something? No, after you. Okay, right. So that's one thing. Secondly, as I, as I hinted earlier, there's a major transition on the way with the tourism sector. I mean, previously, Dominica was not involved in the high-end tourism, you know. For example, when I lived in Barbados for a number of years, you know, I even told you I voted in Barbados as a commonwealth, a citizen of a commonwealth country. So that's why my last daughter was born in Barbados, etc., etc., etc. And... Um, I know there are some hotels in Barbados where you pay over $1,000 a day to stay, you know what I mean? Mm. Um, so they have upmarket, <coughs> at the same time they have places where you can stay at, at $50 a day, you know, guest houses and so on. So typically Dominica wasn't involved in the high end at all, we were mm -hmm. not involved in that, yep. but we are entering them. We have the, we have the Kipinski and, and the Jungle Bay and those new ones that are under construction. So being able to enter that market and to sustain the economy in that area it's not going to be just guesswork and, and good intentions. We, we have to get the systems in place. You know? Yes. I mean, a certain amount of investment has been allocated to those areas, but to get them to, to get the, the, the seed that is being planted now to bear fruit will take a lot of energy and, and things of that nature. So that's another area to add to the manifesto point as well. And two others I would mention, the question of the, um, the, the agriculture. I mean, having worked in the Ministry of Finance for a number of years, I mean, rising to the level of financial secretary, I mean, I know it's not easy to get money from the World Bank. I mean, I've, I've dealt with them enough to know that. And we have a commitment from them currently, the government, government of the day, for 25 million US dollars for agriculture. Wow. And I mean, so, and if we manage, and I know this gentleman, Mr. Kirvin Stevenson, I know him very well, he used to work with ICA, which is the prim one of the premier agriculture agencies for the, for the region along with Cardi, and he worked there for a number of years. I remember when Eugenia Charles was Prime Minister, he was manager of the DBMC. The building was done by, um, close to where um, the SMART is now, where the lands and surveys is in. He was manager of that. Um, so a very experienced gentleman. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, Under Prime Minister Douglas. Under Prime Minister Douglas? Yes, he was general manager. General, right, okay. But, after he, but when, when Eugenia was there, he, as though he had a... He was the operations manager. Operations manager, fine. Yeah. So, He's been agriculture for long, and I know he's a fellow he's highly motivated. I know him reasonably well. So I believe that um, with 25 million US, which is 60 something million, if we manage this thing carefully, I think there's enormous amount of so project management, getting the results, getting the outcome, you know, taking your time and doing it properly. I mean, this, that's just another very good example of areas in which you can move forward. And as Dr. Henry mentioned, the, 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 you know, the State College, I mean, um, 
you know, the opportunities that are there for the young people to take advantage, to get the skills, not just in terms of the academics, but in terms of the technical, vocational, um, you know, and, and things of that nature. Um, and they, they can, and, they, they, and, and, and not only do they not have a problem with tuition, but they get assistance to get there. So really, it reminds me of my dad when I was growing up. He said, all you have to do is study your books, study your lessons, because you, you, you do not go to bed hungry. You have transportation to get from your home to school. You know, I mean, you're getting all the help you need. Your role is to master the, the work that is given to you at the college and, and, and succeed, and then come back to play a part now in the country. This business about um, the country having used its resources to help you succeed, and then you go away and you don't come back. I mean, we have to move away from that. I mean, always a good thing to spend some time overseas to get the experience and get the, um, the, um, the, um, the you know, you know remit the remittances is also important and you get you you know I, 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 nothing wrong with spending some time overseas but you need to give back to the country that help you get on your feet so i'm, I'm very optimistic about dominica i mean they, they, that's why i'm so anxious that we should get over this electoral reform matter um you know and don't um, don't rush it because like i say when you rush the brush you get dabbed take our time and deal with it but do not allow us to allow it to distract us and i think dr yeah. Jean made a good point that um, once you have politicians engaging in a matter that is better dealt with by the practitioners, by the technicians, you know, and then, then they, they, they strategize in a certain way that maybe it could be more effective if it wasn't in the hands. And really, because maybe we, the technicians, failed to do what we were supposed to have done, whether from the commission standpoint or otherwise, it was inevitable that the politicians would take it over and, and, the and say they're ruining it. So they we shouldn't blame so them to multi politicians. We would we'll probably better not blame you know, you know ourselves as technicians, whether technicians in the ministry or technicians in a statutory body, such as the electoral commission. We're going to take um, um, Morris, uh, Morris again as he will repeat the results and give us some new results coming in. We have some additional results for you now. Let's go straight to uh, Wesley Primary, that is uh, polling station VO2, S to Z, Basil 64, 64, Grant 53, 53, with one reject ballot. Woodford Hill Primary, VO1, Q to Z, Basil 52, Grant 77, 77, rejected ballot one, and there's one spoilt ballot. B O one I to P, that's the Woodford Hill primary, Basil sixty three, six three, grant ninety. Well, three spoil three three rejected ballots there, three rejected and one spot. Let's go over this for you. Just B O B O one I to P Woodford Hill primary Basil sixty three grant 90 and you have three rejected ballots with one spoiled ballot there b01 c to h woodford hill primary 67 basil 92 grant with two rejected ballots let's move over to maho polling station f02 a to d fisheries blackmore 102 thomas 6262 f03 E to J, Community Center, Blackmore, 132, Thomas, 64. Rosa South now, check uh, zero, that is 003, 003, win Rosa South, 003, L to Z, that's uh, the Old Health Center, Old Health Center, Shakira, 105, 105, Francis, 52, 52, at uh, polling station 002, Harlem, A to Z, A to Z, you have Shakira there, 57, 57, and uh, Francis, 50. At uh, 003, A to K, Shakira Lockhart, uh, 107, and Francis, 33. So this is what we have for you so far. We will continue to bring you the results as they become available. Please stay tuned. Keep watching the broadcast. All right. Um, yes, and, and we were... Can we repeat I, the results before we go? Yes, um, and we just 
received some new results and uh, if I were to just repeat them. Um, so far what we have from Maho is the incumbent, um, Mr. Blackmore, 104, 76, 102 and 132. And his opponent is 62, 41, 62 and 64. In Wesley, we have um, results coming from one, two, three, four, five polling stations. Um, Mr. Ezekiel Basil having 75, 62, 64, 52, and 63. And Mr. Fidel Neil Grant having 89, 73, 53, 77, and 90. We also have results coming, our first results from Rosa Soft, indicating that um, the incumbent, Mr. Um, Francois, um, Francis, has results of the following numbers, 52, 50, and 33, and uh, Ms. Shakira Hippolyte Lockhart having 105, 57, and 107. So this is some of the new results coming forward so far. I want to um, continue engaging Dr. Jean-Jacques. Mm. Um, having heard from our economists here and um, Dr. Valle in terms of the areas of priorities that she mentioned, mm -hmm. in terms of governance, job creation for youth, um, health care, um, with specific indication of the national health in, um, insurance, and also agro-processing and offshoot of agriculture, um, I want to ask you to, to give us, um, over the years um, of, of, of Dominica and what you have seen in Dominica, is there any um, enablers? What, what are the enablers? What, what is the thing that actually causes these priority areas to really take root over the next five years or have they taken? What is your view in terms of what is really required for us to get going through this? actual areas if they were to become priorities in the next five What do we years need to do to make, for example, um, um, Dr. Henry mentioned manufacturing, youth employment, mm -hmm. I think she did. These are my areas and therefore I think, she, I, I think they, yeah. they coincide health insurance. Mm -hmm. um, there's one I have here which she didn't mention or Dr. Um, Douglas didn't mention. Go back to my national dialogue, and I can speak some more about that. What do we need to do to make what, all of this? What, what, what are the enablers? Let's let's speak to the enablers so that the, the general yeah, public can understand that what is required to make those things happen, and where we are as a country in terms of those enablers. Why, Dr. Present. Henry wants this one, and I heard her in the radio, not in the news, not all ago, and I am sure she has a lot to it's say on just, both I mean, the manufacturing and the youth. Yes, but no, I'm not even going to go in the detail. You know what I think is needed. A national vision for this country. Now, um, having said that, um, the Honorable Prime Minister has um, articulated his national vision and which has been spread across the country and is, is taken on mm -hmm. as Dominica becoming the, the first, first climate, climate resilient, resilient nation. nation. To what extent your, your, your statement that we need a national vision and the national vision that is exposed by, by the Honorable Prime Minister. To what, ex what, what is the thinking here? Very good. That is where I was coming, but you jumped ahead. So what it could say to the Prime Minister after Maria, Dominica, the first climate resilient nation in the world. So if that's our national vision. The question becomes, what does that mean to the average person on the road? Mm. Has the average person on the road understood that? What is his or her role to play in that? And that has to be critical. Until we get there, it's just a statement. And we have not done that yet. And we, that's just a statement. We have not done that And yet. I, I give an example of Trinidad, Vision 2020. Remember when Trinidad, three years back, said Vision 2020? Mm. Trinidad, a developing world, a first world nation. That went through... That message went through. So you enter Trinidad from the time you got in, from the immigration officer you met first, to the custom officer, to the taxi driver you met outside. Before you even entered Trinidad proper, everybody spoke to you about Vision 2020 and their role to play. I was so impressed with that. When I got on a taxi and the man said, you know, have you heard about our vision? And he begins to tell me. And he says, you know what is my role as a taxi driver? 
I am one of the first ambassadors you meet. It means I cannot have a, a vehicle that's broken down. It must be tied. It must be this. It must be that. I, and he began. By the time you got to Trinidad, by the time I, when I left Trinidad, you swear I was Vision 2020 myself. Mm -hmm. But no, more than that, the government changed. And you know one of the weaknesses of our Caribbean politics is that the government changes and almost always they throw away almost everything that they met before. Mm -hmm. to start afresh and the government in fact maybe wanted to do that but the vision 2020 was so embedded in the psyche of the Trinidadians in all of their processes that it has survived government change after government change and that is why for us I think that is part of what is missing because what is also happens is that once we bring it through then there is something that we can all work towards. There is something that we are all working towards. And agenda. that, because it is a common goal, we're all working towards something common. We may use different routes to get there, but we know what that common goal is. And that, I think, until we can get that, until we can get Dominica working towards a common vision, a vision that each and every one of us understand, not just it, knowing it by name, but our role to play in it. I think we will still be plodding here and plodding here without, at the end of the day, saying this is what it and is. And there's one benefit to um, what Dr. Henry is saying. One of the benefits of, of, of making this vision, uh, articulating it such that everybody knows these are is that it reduces the cost, it shares the cost of implementing the vision. Mm -hmm. Let's very take very the, the, the resilience yeah. agenda, for example. Yeah. If you take any government uh, document right now on the re resilience agenda, you will see it's heavily focused, it's heavily state-centric. Mm -hmm. It's the state mm -hmm. spending a lot mm -hmm. of resources into doing things. Whereas the little man on the ground, he himself has a part to play in making us a little more resilient. So if you can bring him in and he can understand his role, you're going to share the burden, share the cost, as well as make him feel that this is part of his own plan as well for Dominica. Now, this takes us back to what I have mentioned earlier, the national dialogue. We have the resilience agenda. It seems to me most persons have, you know, embraced it. Most persons are aware of it, although most persons are not, as Dr. Henry said, you know, they, they haven't really made, made it part of their own. But for us to, for us to move forward, we ask them moving forward beyond tonight, beyond this weekend. I truly believe we need to sit down with people I have in my head what I call a citizen's council. So it's not just sit down for one month and we talk and talk and talk, take notes and we have a document, etc. It's not just that because the document has to be a living document otherwise we waste our time. I suggest that we should have throughout the next electoral elect, um, election cycle of five years, every maybe every two months, maybe every three months, we have a citizen council whereby the citizens will meet with the Prime Minister, the leader of the opposition, and they will also de 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 um, 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 describe which other persons they want to have in a panel. But we ask them all kinds of questions. We are free to, to, to engage them openly and honestly, respectfully, of course. Mm -hmm. So they're there, they're right now, well, they're going to be our servants in any case. They serve us. So gonna, they're going to come there to take our questions, listen to our gripes, listen to what we have to say, and they're going to present honest information and it's a citizen taking charge what that's going to do is going to make that citizen feel more empowered dominica is truly his own or own um build trust a little more trust in the state um, um entities currently um this federal say there's a lot of distrust i think you may answer that doctor. a lot of distrust between the state and the citizen that is a that is a serious cause of concern for me. So if we also move forward, I want us to do the manufacturing. I want us to have this health insurance is about time. We have this um, pilot which we have extended. I think the PM Minister of Finance extended this last budget. We have also youth employment. That is an area of concern to me, although I don't quite understand why, because they, we have this decent education system. We also have the youth business trust. We also have youth skills. We have um, the small business grants uh, managed by the, by the Ministry of Commerce. We have money in the aid bank. We have the NDFD. <laughs> the resources going around to support 
young persons and myself based on different positions where I've worked, I know I've seen how young persons can be engaged, but yet still we have this year of um, unemployment issue. It might be that many of our youth who are unemployed and maybe not employable for some of the other jobs that we have. So you want to speak the NEP. Well, well NEP as well. Youth but when you speak of employment, you also have to speak of employability. Is the person who's unemployed truly employable for the job that you want to offer him or her? So that might be a way we have. I don't quite understand why we have so many youth unemployed still, or maybe we don't have as many as we think. Is it, is but that's it, an issue we have is to look it at. Is a situation where um, the rate of return, um, seeing that you, uh, one of you mentioned earlier on, we have done well in terms of educating our public, in terms of the education policy in Dominica, has a good fit in terms of having academic qualifications, etc. Is it a situation where we have the rate of return on that education or pace in the rate of development that could absorb these, these, really, um, these educated individuals? I was a is principal. I was a yeah. principal. What is the situation going on? Yeah. I was a principal, and from my perspective, we 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 help many young persons. Um, Get CXCs at uh, ones and twos. We haven't had CX ones and twos, but we don't necessarily hammer home in the head how to hold a job, how to get a job, and how to secure a job, and how to maintain that job. So we struggle with them. We, we do try, you know, but we don't try hard enough. We struggle with them to stay tidy, come on time, but we have given up, surrendered, if you will. Um, to certain pressures, and therefore we accept persons coming to to school not properly dressed. Mm -hmm. We accept when they speak to us improperly, and when they go to a job, the first two days you have to ask the, the managers, ask them to go back home and think long and hard whether you really want to work. So we, although we help them to gain the education, we have not succeeded, I believe, in making them employable. <coughs> So they're not very attractive, many of them, as 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 potential employees to keep. I mean, we have we have a number of cases. I, I would, maybe I would mention that um, institution, but we have cases in Dominica where young persons, when they go to work, they cannot last. They struggle because the discipline of being on time, um, eating certain. You can't eat certain areas. You can't do certain things. You know that is a little too much for them. Do you want to add something, Doctor Douglas? Well, I, I'm not sure how much time I have. Yes. So, so we're going to go across to Julian Morris again as he has. What we'll do is just take a, a studio break and we will return shortly thereafter where we'll continue our discussions and some other um, results from Julian Morris. All right. So let's just take a break and hopefully we'll be back shortly. Because of the space and the, the lack of microphones, we have to get somebody out to get Peter Wicker. 35 votes. That's after the results of three out of 19 polling stations. So we have a lot to go in this particular constituency. In the Salisbury constituency held by the UWP's Hector John, Nicholas Shanks Esprit of the Dominica Labour Party is trailing with 48 votes to 212 of Hector John of the United Workers Party. Hector John, United Workers Party, 212. Nicholas Shank, S3, 48 votes. Two out of nine polling stations in this particular constituency. Soufre constituency, we have the results of three out of 11 polling stations. Denise Charles, the incumbent of the Dominica Labour Party, 407 votes. Samuel Christian of the United Workers Party, 162 votes. Denise Charles, the incumbent, 407, Samuel Christian, United Workers Party, 162. That's three out of 11 constituencies, 11 polling stations in the Sufre constituency. Wesley constituency is held by Ezekiel Basil of the United Workers Party. We have the results of four out of 12 polling stations. Fidel Grant of the Dominica Labour Party, leading with 312 votes. Ezekiel Basil, the incumbent of the United Workers Party, 242 votes. So in the Wesley constituency, with four out of 12 polling stations, we have the DLP, the Dominica Labour Party's Neil Grant, leading with 312. Ezekiel Basil, 
242. So the situation after we have partial results from five constituencies is that the Dominican Labour Party is leading in the Maho, Roseau South, and Sufre, Sufre and Wesley constituencies. That's Wesley, Sufre, Maho, and Roseau South be the Labour Party's leading and the United Workers Party leading in the Salisbury constituency. We will try to update you every half hour as we get the official results. Meantime, we go back to the panelists. D038 to seat. D03 down to D-03-12, A2C, Montine Resource Center. Bridges, 113, 113, 113. Packet, 7. 7, no. <laughs> 7. There was one rejected ballot. <laughs> <laughs> D zero three K to Z D zero three K to Z D zero three dash fourteen Tetmon Montin Resource Center K to Z Packet ten one zero Regis one four zero one forty There were three rejected ballots. D03, D to J, D03, 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 D02-5 Grand Bay, House of Melanie Henderson. A to A. D02-A to A. A to A. Packet 8. Regis 56-5-6. 10 rejected ballots. Wow. Oh my God. Salivia. Salivia. R02. And we have, you know, presence, Mr. Um, Peter Wickham from Kadra. Um, uh, he's going to share with us his um, initial predictions of the elections, the polls that he has taken to of coming up to the general elections today. And so as we receive results, we will be able to do a comparison and see to what extent those predictions um, are in keeping with um, the results that are emerging. So I um, would like to allow Mr. Peter Wickham to introduce himself and, and to give us some um, ideas on yeah. what is work about and how we can add to our discussion. Okay, thank you for, for the invitation and it's good to be with you. This is my first Dominica election. Uh, I've covered several elections across the region. This is my first time I'm actually making it here. So I'm happy to be with you. Uh, and it looks as though it's a start. That I think is the, the significant point that has to be made. Um, let me just tell you, you know, in, in the interest of disclosure, that the polls that we did, the polls that we did, did show that there would be a swing against the Labour Party, um, but we had estimated that swing would have been in the vicinity of around two percent. Um, my sense was that that would have been insufficient to dislodge the Labour Party, but we felt that the Labour Party would struggle to manage several marginal seats, and I had identified between five and seven of them that were marginal. Um, what happens tonight, what seems to have happened is that they seem to have been able to manage these seats, uh, and they have been able to manage them so well that they were able to capture the marginal ones and, and, and were able to identify one or two more to add. Uh, I'm particularly keen on the analysis of Central, because my sense was that Labour obviously had a strategy that said if they can anchor their support in Central, and they can start, one could say, an assault on Roseau, uh, to bring Rosa back to what it, it, it would have been uh, by putting the Prime Minister's wife in that seat, the idea would have been to essentially set up an anchor. Uh, that seemed to have paid dividends. Uh, so that seems to be what is happening. My, my sense now is that your estimated swing will be a pro-Labour Party swing, 
and it will probably be to the to the extent of around two or three percentage points, which is consistent with the uh, margin of error that our polls would have predicted. So I think that the polls have, have stood up well. Um, what you will end up, however, with is uh, a government that is stronger numerically, but there are going to be a whole lot of seats that are marginal, uh, and I suspect that you'll be heading to court tomorrow morning, bright and early, where mm -hmm. the UWP will be challenging the results in pretty much all of them that they believe that they would have won uh, by, uh, uh, well, the, the margin is, is relatively small. But it's historic, and I think that that's something that we can lose sight of the fact. You, you don't get many fourth-term governments in the Caribbean, and you certainly don't get many fifth-term governments. Uh, and I think that what you've been able to pull off tonight in Dominica is, is interesting. Um, my gut feeling is that the events of the last week um, mm -hmm. had a lot to do with the reason why you're seeing this result. I think mm -hmm. that people were disgusted. Um, my, my feeling as I was coming over and speaking to people, a lot of people who were saying to me that they were afraid of this outcome because they were concerned at how the UWP would react and how they would be able to take defeat. Now, my, my sense is that Dominicans were, were perhaps sickened by what they saw, uh, and that's what they have, have voted against. Uh, and let's be clear, uh, to be able to lose uh, an election, a fourth-term election for the UWP is, is a major indictment because normally by the time you have reached fourth term, exhaustion alone should be enough to be able to propel you into office. And if you're not able to do that on this occasion, as I said, it's a huge indictment in terms of what they brought to the table in the election. So those are my initial comments. Uh, I am really happy that it has been peaceful. Uh, I was very concerned that it might not have been, and I think that that is a major achievement. If this country has been through enough with hurricanes and natural disasters to not have to add uh, uh, an unpeaceful election, and that's part of the reason I thought that the events of the last week were so so unfortunate. Now, the events of the last week has been um, centered around electoral reform. Yeah. Um, what was the senses you were capturing um, before that um, would uh, indicate that it would have a significant impact on the overall results so, today? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you mean what were people saying about electoral Sorry. reform? Yeah, no, I mean, as I said, when I did my poll, I asked people about the key issue that was keeping them up at night. People were concerned about the economic situation. They were concerned about employment. Electoral reform was not something that was mentioned. Having said that, however, I do believe that Dominicans would like to see reform. Mm -hmm. I believe that it is something that people think, you know, the time has come. Um, the, the issues which are on the table, issues of cleaning up the voters' list, it's, it's not unreasonable. Uh, the voter ID or national ID, which is what I really prefer, a national ID, that is also not unreasonable. Um, and then you have to answer the question of overseas voters, whether it is something that you're comfortable with and you want to maintain, or whether it is something that you want to keep in check. Uh, we have a huge debate going in St. Kitts and Nevis now about overseas voting. Uh, and that has taken on all kinds of different proportions because the opposition there is opposing it. They are opposing the, the removal of overseas voters. So the issues, I think, are reasonable issues that have to be discussed. My challenge all the time was that you cannot sign on to an election, say you're going to fight it based on rules that are existing, sign a code of conduct with the church, mm -hmm. and then say that you are demanding electoral reform in what? It would have been two weeks uh, or three weeks. It's, it's just unrealistic. And I think that was my challenge and the challenge a lot of people had with the demand that it's unrealistic to expect reform to happen in three weeks. Uh, I was involved in the, in the electoralist cleansing in St. Kitts back in, in um, 2004, I believe it was. Uh, it took us 18 months mm -hmm. for the smaller list. Here in, Saint, in, in Dominica, you have a larger list. Um, there's no way that you could do it in three months. So I, I do think that those are issues that you guys have to sit down and start to look at now going forward with a clear head. Uh, mm -hmm. You have another five years, so hopefully if there are no, not with no major national, natural disasters, you should be in a position to deal with some of these issues. Um, some persons claim that um, this, this electoral reform is not a three weeks back issue and has been in the free for, yeah. for quite a while now. Is that feature mm -hmm. in, in the... No, I, I honestly thought before, before Hurricane Erica, before Maria and Storm Erica, Issues of electoral reform were a lot more pertinent. I mean, there was a lot of talk about the, uh, certainly the setup of the national ID. I know there was legislative and administrative action, but I, I personally felt that priorities change when, when you had a hurricane to deal with, and so you should. So th that's my sense, that I think if you did not have a hurricane, it would have been difficult for us not to have dealt with reform issues by now. 
uh, I do, however, feel that the priority shifted some time ago. Um, and, you know, a lot of the people who were displaced by the hurricane are the ones who are the overseas voters that are at the center of this conversation. I mean, you can't displace somebody from their house uh, by way of Hurricane Maria, send them to Barbados to live in and tell them that you can't participate in elections. It seems a bit unreasonable. So mm -hmm. maybe next time around, you know, you can have a, a better um, handle on these things. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Going forward in, in elections, um, let's, let's move away from the discussions on electoral reform. Um, but in terms of the process, um, is there anything that you have found that is um, peculiar to Dominica that might be not so or doesn't deal uh, in the rest of the region? What, what comparisons that you will be able to share with us? Um, I know so far I get, I get a sense that the electoral system is like the rest of the region in the sense that it hasn't really developed a whole lot in the last 40, 50 years. I mean, we still vote the old-fashioned way with the next. Um, I, I believe that there could be some streamlining regarding the counting and the delivery of results. Um, I noticed that we are here at Minister 8, and everyone knows what has happened, but yet still, in terms of the official release of data, that has not happened. And I think that that clearly is something that has to be tightened up. Um, you guys use Electoral Inc.? Yes. Right? Indelible right? Indelible yes. mm -hmm. um, I, I was just explaining to someone in, that we don't have that in Barbados. No? No. Um, we also don't have a voter ID in Barbados. <laughs> so and we, we, we also have a heavily bloated list. Basically, you just cross off the name of the person that votes and you move on. Um, so, so how do you check that the person doesn't go, doesn't go somewhere Because else. you can only vote one way, one place. Nobody so can go in another parish. Mm -hmm. no? You can only vote one place. Your name is at one point. So if you go to your polling station, your name is checked off by not only the electoral officer, but by the two representatives of the parties. Yeah, if you attempt to go back and vote again, then basically your name is there. Um, if, however, you appeared and you try to vote in somebody else's name, there you go. that's perhaps something that could happen. But again, mm -hmm. in a small society like Barbados, it's hard for that to happen. I think in a small society like Dominica, it's harder for it's that to happen. So I just mentioned those things just to give the, give the sense that they, there's no reason to believe that the electoral system in Dominica is so backward. Uh, in many ways, it is a lot more advanced than in some other countries. Uh, people don't realize that there's no such thing as voter ID in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no such thing. Right there's a big thing where the government wants to introduce it, and yeah. the opposition, the Labour Party, say no, and a lot of other civic yeah. institutions organizations mm -hmm. claiming that it will disenfranchise especially the older person so it, it is so interesting that it actually right now that mm -hmm. debate is raging in in england because you know the mm -hmm. 12 right just yeah. next to wednesday then we have an election right. mm -hmm. so i guess that is also mm -hmm. um, so so i'm just saying that you know we we feel that these issues are you know they're so fundamental and, and this is the impression that and i tell you the uwp did a fantastic job of presenting this information a lot of misinformation in the public domain you know, um, they were reading results of Cadre's polls that I, I knew nothing about. And I mean, some of the most absurd things. And I was listening to Lennox Linton saying that this is what the poll says. And you know, and this is what Wickham is saying. And I'm like, well, where is this information coming from? But they have done an excellent job of convincing people across the region that there is something fundamentally wrong here. Uh, and I believe that, you know, you can learn a lot from their strategies. Uh, but clearly, it is something also that you have to push back against. And as I said, when we talk about electoral reform, we have to be clear that we're not dealing with a system that is all that backward. We're not dealing with a system that's all that different from a lot of what you know, uh, it, we, we have in other countries. So yeah, so that's my, my thing. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, certainly we have seen the discussions coming out from many individuals mm -hmm. indicating that um, our electoral um, system is so backward mm -hmm. and that m most of the Caribbean islands have moved on. But it is interesting to hear that you, coming from the other Caribbean islands, you, you, you have a different view. Yeah. The, the um, thing with the bloated list is also something I wanted to mention quickly because um, in the last election, your electoral turnout was something in the order of 57%. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the features of a bloated list is a very low uh, voter turnout. Mm -hmm. um, in Barbados, it's the same thing, around 60%. Mm -hmm. um, in Jamaica, Trinidad, and Tobago, and in all of these instances, there has been no cleansing of the list. There has been no um, you know, re-registration period. Uh, so that's perhaps something that you, know, you may want to think about but it is a process which is time consuming, it's long, mm -hmm. and it's also very expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, but that too is also not an unusual thing. Uh, my thing is, 
There's nothing wrong with having a lot of people on the list who can't vote once those people do not vote. Mm -hmm. If, if you have people who are dead that vote, you have a problem. <laughs> but if you have a list that has dead people on it and they don't vote, it is not any different to what happens in, in many other, um, other, other countries. What the United Kingdom has done, though, is that they have passed legislation that forces people to re-register every year at a particular house, uh, which is something that Dominica can do. The problem is that if you do that, it then also means that this whole idea of ancestral voting where I vote in my mother's constituency. So I travel all the way back to, to Vicas because that's where my mother cast her ballot. And, mm -hmm. and, and you know, um, people who want to vote for Rosie Douglas in Portsmouth, even though he's dead, you know, may want to go back there and vote. All of that would have to stop if you impose a system that said to people, you have to vote where you live mm -hmm. by legislation. But that's the, 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 the easiest way to ensure that you don't have the situation with, with a bloated list. You, you pass legislation that says January the, the 3rd, you have to sign a document that says this is where I'm living and this is where I'm voting by law every year. Based on the, um, the recommendations, I think they call it a validation of your thing yeah. or um, just a confirmation process mm -hmm. that not a re-registration but basically mm -hmm. confirming that one, you're still alive, mm -hmm. two, you still exist mm -hmm. and you are willing to vote in a particular constituency. Yeah. But but it brings it brings to further debate, and I'm not sure. I think it's Dr. Valder who wants mm -hmm. to um, add here. Is, um, there has been a continuous argument that um, the government, all right, and government is not defined. It's usually not defined when when a, a political party lashes out, and there's always an accusation of the government which creates a proximity to the ruling party in government. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to, to look at how do we start to help individuals separate mm -hmm. the issues of governance, which you, you mentioned earlier on, that we can have those clear distinctions so people understand the process and, and how it emerges today that we actually have an election there's a sitting government, and government continues, whereas political parties may emerge as the government of the day or not. So what I'd like us to, to, to discuss is what, what discussions do we need to have going forward? And uh, having a researcher here, what, what kind of information that we need to, to garner? What, what sort of information we need to share with the public? that will allow people to start looking at the whole process in a different light as what's been over the past um, weeks. I think, again, it starts with education. <laughs> I'm sorry to look like Ministry of Education was the same. I'm trying to do them so much more work. <laughs> but I remember even in this election season, maybe more, no, it was more, that even when the House was um, you know, dissolved, there was still a lot of persons unclear whether the government is still in office this person is not in office and so on. So it look, although yes, we say we have the Westminster system, to a lot of extent, what does that mean? And how many persons truly of us truly understand what the system means? Mm -hmm. And so again, I think it, it, it boils down to, to education, it boils down, yes, the school, but also to, as I, I go back to again, the Electoral Commission itself has to play a more critical role in educating the public. You can't just see it, yes, I know that is its core role for elections, but we need to begin to hear from the commission more. It needs to begin to go on outreach programs, outreach organizations, and even the parties themselves too. Don't just wait when it's election to begin to think. The parties themselves, because the party machinery continues, you know. And in fact, as Gerald made the point, you can say that the parties um, and the, your opposition has often been accused, maybe not the right, this, the, the right word here, of accused of not stopping campaigning from the time they lost election in 2000. And so is it just campaigning and just, you know, pinging on emotions, as Gerald says sometimes, but also to, in terms of educating? Because education, you can say what we want, but education is one of the fundamental instruments and tools for change. Because until people are educated fully, they just go along. And so I think the political parties themselves must begin to also take on that mandate. 
so that when persons go to the poll, you know, as we say, we make an informed decision. We don't just vote because my mother voted here, my father voted mm -hmm. here, and so forth and so on. But we understand what our vote means. So our vote is not just an X by a shoes or a saw or whatever. But when I vote for this shoes or this saw, this is what I am getting, mm -hmm. you know? And so, I mean, I used to take my early years. I used to say, you know, I would vote not, I never voted parties, I voted for persons. But then I began to, to begin to think, and I said, but wait, parties, um, people in, in and of themselves don't form the, the government. Mm -hmm. What form the government is the party. So in essence, if I'm voting a person, I'm also voting a party. Mm -hmm. And then begin to, to stretch my analysis a little bit more in terms of how I vote, you know, and, and, and I guess that's why I've voted different places all over, you know, because when I, I, I come to my own conclusion that this is not where I would like to go or head to go, then I make a decision accordingly. And so I think we need to begin to educate, to be, or educate ourselves a bit more and educate the, the, the nation um, so that we, you know, we make choices that, um, you know, the right choices for I'm, ourselves. I'm going to pick um, Peter mm -hmm. again. Um, there is a, 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 a particular observation, and I'm not sure if it is lost to the public, but um, since independence, 1980, I, I recall clearly as an, a 10-year-old boy that we had the um, United the Dem Lab, we yeah. had the Labour Party, yeah. we had the Freedom Party, mm -hmm. and we had independent candidates. It is observed that it is the first time since independence that we actually had a two-party race. It was a clear either-or situation. To what extent um, hmm. we, we, we see any peculiarities here because it's the first time we had a clear one-on-one -on -one race? I, I think that you had a clear one-on-one -on -one race for the last three elections. Um, there were essentially <laughs> two political parties. No, I mean, we, we, we talk a lot right. about... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Statistics show that. Yeah, we, we talk a lot about the fact that, you know, we have multiple parties in the Caribbean and we have independent candidates and whatnot, but by and large, no one really takes them seriously. When a political party doesn't get uh, up to 2% of the vote, the share of national vote, it's, it's for all intents and purposes irrelevant. And I think that that has been the case for a while in Dominica, where you've essentially had a, a mature two-party system where you, know, you, you don't have an alternation of power because uh, the UWP is yet to assert itself as a party that can hold power and win elections because it, it really has only ever done so once, but I mean, since independence. But ultimately, you have two parties, two strong parties that have about 40% of support. And, and that, to me, is the quintessential definition of a political party. The idea that you have a, a, a candidate running and, and getting one or two votes, or a party running and getting one or two votes. I think Freedom, last election, um, got a couple of percentage points. Well, because Freedom yeah. party, 2.3% yeah. of the yeah. vote in 2009, yeah. they, um, mm -hmm. 2014. Yeah. No, they didn't contest, right? Yeah, yeah, they didn't contest in 2014. 2014. 2014. So there's nothing in yeah. 2014, but 2.39 in 2009, 2.15 mm. in 2005, yeah, I'm saying 2.4. 2.57 mm. in 2000, 35 percent mm. in 1995. So between mm. 1995 and say 2009, they moved yeah. from 35 percent to 2, 2 percent yeah. of the vote. Mm. So, you, so you so have almost a two-party system. Itself yeah. 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 Irrelevant or non-existent. Yeah. 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 I mean, what, what I wanted to say to the um, in, in regard to this whole idea of education is that I think that we have to be careful that we don't get ahead of ourselves. Um, what the, the Brexit conversation in the UK, what the constitutional conversation in Grenada and in Antigua and also in, in, in St. Vincent has taught me, that Caribbean people are genuinely not interested in getting too heavily involved in matters of governance. I think they're happy to vote and let politicians take decisions on their behalf. And I think that we have to be careful that we don't attempt to offload too much of our, uh, let's say our, as, as political people, too much of our responsibility on them. People want to make simple decisions and they want to leave the big decisions to politicians. Um, I do feel that there is an opportunity for a greater buy-in in Dominica in terms of people's involvement in processes. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we need to have civics programs explaining the details of, of government to people so that they sit down and understand. Because I don't think that's something that the average Dominican teenager is interested in understanding. And I don't think that they need to necessarily. You know. so let's, yeah. let's go to the issue yeah. of candidates um, in, your, in your own um, analysis, and that goes out to, to all members of the panel. Um, is the cadre of candidates that have featured in the election something that you see some improvement, some uh, wanting, some areas? 
Okay. Improving in what areas you're looking at? No, in terms of the candidates themselves. In, terms of the, the, in other words, you have decided because the minimum requirements by law um, is, is, is being 21 year old, being uh, non religious, and you're not of the religious, uh, when the not religious having a criminal club, record. And you have no. <laughs> criminal record or you're not a bankrupt mm -hmm. uh, basically that's the the basic minimal qualification to be a member of parliament do we see a, a gradual movement or, or some tolerance in, in higher caliber of candidates or, or do we see the same thing that that, that gives uh, back back then i think it's an improvement i think when you look at the, the, the candidates and the, the you know mm -hmm. the, the slate of candidates candidate, um, you saw an improvement in terms of academic mm -hmm. achievements. You saw an improvement in community terms involvement. of community involvement. Mm -hmm. You saw an improvement in terms of um, reaching out to, to to the public and so on. So when you looked at the candidates, by and large, you had good candidates. Um, mm -hmm. You know that you could say yes, could represent. You know the represent you well, represent the constituency well. So it both was parties, huh? yeah, both parties, yeah. both parties, and uh, both parties. I have the thing right before me Octavia Alfred, Ernie John Finn, two former teachers or, or even principals, um, Catherine Daniel, Nicholas George, two strong yeah. candidates. Miss um, Catherine being our registrar of CXCs and you know, senior civil servant, Nicholas George being what left at what superintendent or higher, um, in the, in the police force. Ms. Regina Austria, who's been there for veteran politician, uh, um, politician. Then you have Marcus Re um, Roman, who I don't know very well, but good. Edward Aregis, snapped packet, good candidates. Kent Edwards, Francisca. So when we looked at the candidates, you know, on paper, the candidates were strong candidates. So <laughs> results are coming out now. So let's just move over to um, Julian Morris and um, let's get some. Um, new results coming. Yes, we, we do now have some additional uh, results for you. Uh, we go straight to uh, Good Hope. That's the uh, resource center there. A03, A to J, John Finn 111, Alfred 67. John Finn 111, Alfred 67. A05, K to Z, John Finn. So Libya. So J. J. San. Two, two, two. Also of um. Ilford John Atkinson. Have one you have so Libya, let me just go over this again to clarify at the house of Hilford John Atkinson that's Atkinson now um, you have um, R01 A to J Sanford 58 Frederick 122 you have I see here 11 rejected ballots R01, K to Z, A to Z, I should say, Atkinson Resource Center, 69, Sanford, 131, Frederick, two rejected ballots, and one spoiled ballot. There's some additional, <coughs> we had some additional information here for Salibia, that's right. Uh, R O Z, A to Z, A to Z, 45, <coughs> 45 for Sanford, and 82. Frederick, you had two rejected ballots there, one spoiled ballot. And polling station R02, <coughs> excuse me, A to Z, 50, 50 Sanford, and uh, 
That's 50, Sanford, and 69. Frederick, you have two rejected ballots there at that, um, that uh, polling station. We move to MO4, A to Z, that's uh, Rose Central. You have uh, Coffee, Coffee, 44, 44, and uh, Melissa Skerritt, 62. Coffee, 44, Melissa Skerritt, 62. That's at MO4 at the St. Mary's, doesn't say, okay, but it says St. Mary's, okay, Rose Central in an event, Coffee, 44, Skerritt, 62. You have one rejected ballot there. We move to Rose South. O, that is O zero eight, D to I. You have at the Roseau Primary School, the Roseau Primary School, Lockhart one o eight, and Francis one o nine. Six rejected ballots, four spoiled, four spoiled ballots. And um, I, in Grand Bay, <coughs> I don't think we've, um, we've we've read this to you. We've presented Grand Bay. Uh, we have here at uh, polling session D03, A to C, Regist 113, Packet 7. Regist 113, Packet 7. That's at the uh, Martin Resource Center. You have there as well one rejected ballot. So to go over Grand Bay for you again, D03, A to C, Regist 113, 113, and Packet 7 with one rejected ballot. Polling station D03, K to Z. Martin Resource Center, Regist 140, 140, and uh, Packet 10, Regist 140, Packet 10, three rejected ballots. Polling station uh, D03, <coughs> excuse me, D03, D to J, 95, Regist 7, Packet, Regist 95, 95, Packet 7, uh, one spoils ballot. Polling station D O Z A, that is... Um, House of uh, Melanie Henderson, you have Regist receiving 56 votes and a packet, it with 10, 10 rejected ballots. Now, what's interesting so far is that while we've, the, the results have been coming in, we are getting um, really preliminary indication that this is, none of this is, is officially final, but this is basically preliminarily we're hearing that the Labour Party might be, uh, preliminarily speaking, talking about 18, 18 seats and then so far, so far, this is what we're getting. Now this I must repeat, I have to keep repeating this, this is not, you know, entirely, you know, official or totally conclusive, but it was basically letting you know, you know, some of the hints that we're getting from, from sources as we go along. We will, we, we will um, be back with um, further updates later on in the broadcast. So we are back here again, and as we heard from um, Julia, we have Rosso Central, where the United Workers Party's candidate has um, 44, to DLP candidate Mrs. Skerritt of 62. Um, in Grand Bay, we have four results coming from four polling stations that has a total of um, um, four polling station results, 7, 10, 7, and 8 for the United Workers Party candidate, and for the Dominican Labour Party candidate, Mr. Regis, we have 113, 140, 95, and 58. In Rosasoft, one additional result came out from one additional polling station, which of which 109 to Mr. Francis, and 108 to Mr. Hippolyte Amlokat. So these are the additional results we will go and have right now. We will take a special word um, from Mr. Ilias Dupi from the Election Commission Office, Electoral Office, right now. We are currently experiencing incredibly high levels of traffic on our website servers, which is hampering the delivery of information from poll results to you in, a, in an efficient manner. Results from polling stations in all constituencies have been pouring in, and we have decided to release the information through our local servers to the media here at the Electoral Office and allow them to deliver the results to you. This will lead to a much faster delivery of information and ensure that the public, through the media, is allowed to be brought up to speed with the reports that we have received so far and stay abreast of the reports 
of the reporting polling, polling stations as we go deeper into the night. We want to thank and commend the efforts of the officers who serve today, who have been excellent at delivering the information to the command center here at the electoral office for dissemination to you through the media. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dupi. And that's a message um, indicating that there is high traffic in the um, virtual space for which it is allowing the results to crawl in slower than we, um, we anticipated. Mm -hmm. But you have heard, and I would just like to add that we also had results from um, Cassibrus and Salibier. Um, we have free results from Cassibrus in which the United Workers Party um, candidate has 111, 64, and 51 from free polling districts um, stations and um, the DLP candidates having 67, 75, and 144 out in the Cassibus constituency. Salibier also, we have three polling stations I'm reporting by the electoral office in which the United Workers Party candidate has um, 58, 45, and 50 counted in three polling stations and the DLP candidate having 122, 82, and 69. So that has been our results thus far. Um, the information is slowly creeping in, as we heard from the electoral office, and we're hoping that as the night unfolds, we'll continue to share that information. Let's go back to our analysis and discussion. Well, I mean, this for a statistical point, uh, I'm still seeing um, a swing in favor of the Dominican Labour Party. Um, right now, it's looking at a wrong average of 3%, which is, I think, is quite impressive. Um, and the, but the other point I wanted to make is that the first two terms of Roosevelt Skerritt, there was a positive swing uh, in his favor. Uh, and that's unheard of in, in the Caribbean, where you actually gain votes and seats after being in government. Normally, you win, and then you start to lose. Uh, in the case of the Dominican Labour Party, he had two runs where he improved support and improved uh, seats. And then last election, there was slippage. My assumption is that these elections from this point onward would have been about managing the, the, the slippage, essentially to ensure that you minimize it as much as possible. Yeah. The fact that you've been actually able to flip it and gain support uh, means that there's clearly something happening. And I, I think that it has a lot, the conversation has a lot more to do with the opposition than it has to do with the, the government at this stage. In your own analysis, has the, the opposition put on a significant, um, what you would say, a, a presentation or a position that allowed the, the electorate to, to grab onto? But that, that, that's my thing. I think that the results speak for themselves in the sense that you know, Dominicans clearly did not think that they had any alternative to vote for. Um, and, 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 I, and I go back to my point that after four elections, I mean, the fact that people will just get tired of an individual should mean that you should be able to win an election with one hand tied behind your back. If you can't even hold on to the support that you have and the seats that you have in a situation like this, there's something fundamentally wrong. So it's not for me to say, but I think it's clear that Dominicans are not impressed with the opposition. I think that they need to go back to the drawing board. They need to rethink their strategies. Uh, and I continue that this, 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 this voter intimidation, which ultimately it was over the last couple of weeks, I think it has turned people off. And, and it clearly is a, is a strategy that backfired. Mm -hmm. um, did you observe any, um, considering what you have just said and putting it into perspective, to what extent your, your um, research was showing any high level, was there an uh, abnormal level of undecided voters? Um, yeah. in, in Most definitely, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I think that was the, 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 the peculiarity cost? of the polling that I, that I was doing over the last two years, where it was showing this high level of undecidedness, I guess you could call it that, in, in terms of the uh, polls that we were seeing. Normally, we see in Dominica, like around 20 or, or so percent, uh, we were seeing up to 40 percent of people that were saying that they were undecided. Uh, it is not clear to me what they were undecided about. They were undecided about the opposition. Um, there was a desire for change. I think that there's a feeling that after four terms, you know, we could have a different personality. 
but the, the, the fact that they were undecided means that they were not convinced that there was anything anyone else to vote for. And you were talking earlier about candidacy. Um, it was interesting that I got the opportunity, because uh, normally I don't do focus groups and stuff like that, but I got the opportunity to do a few and to talk to people about candidacy. And it, it was clear that in almost every instance, when you spoke to people about the kind of candidates they want, they started saying they want people's persons. They want candidates who are people's persons. They want candidates who can walk with them, who can hold their hand. They want candidates who can take care of them, which, of course, means give them stuff. But that's a, another conversation for oh, another day. We have to break that <laughs> but, one for sure. But it, it's clear that that's take what care, people man. are looking for in terms of candidacy. I, I'm happy that you now have more women in Parliament. Mm -hmm. I think that that's great, uh, and I think that's a step in the right direction. Certainly, there are a lot more professionals. Uh, again, that's a, a good a good move, a move in the right direction. But certainly, when you talk about candidacy, people want they want people who they believe can come and, and be among them and work with them. Uh, people who will not come to Roseau and sit in the ministry office and, and forget that they're there, but who will come back on weekends or come back on afternoons and hold constituency clinics, find out what people need and work with them towards achieving those objectives. Uh, I think it's fairly clear that uh, Prime Minister Scarrett spent a lot of time <coughs> trying to find candidates that fit those bills and changing and changing them back and going to different people and, and trying to decide in some instances, changing a candidate and then changing that candidate again. But clearly he was trying to find people who he felt could be you know, uh, appealing to what people's desires are. And that's what they really want. They want uh, this idea of being a people's person is something mm -hmm. that I have heard so much uh, over the past couple of years. If I could jump in there yeah. in terms of even city results, and as Peter said, I think early in the year, and I always said that there was definitely a mood for change in Dominic. I think people wanted change. People wanted change for many reasons. The change because, yes, I guess, as he said, after four terms, you say, okay, that's enough. But also, too, I think... You know, we had all of these allegations, all of the things, and people were like, you know what, we need to change. And, and I always said there was also, uh, and I, I have said that before, that if this was, the, to me, the best time for the opposition to have gained power, because if it couldn't do it then, it was going to be very difficult to do it, because no time in the last three, three four elections have the mood for change been so high as it was early in the year. And going forward, and it was, you could see the change. And at one point, even when I was doing it, I said, yeah, OK, the, I had given the, like, the government, the opposition would have won. Then it kind of got a little bit tighter um, in my you know, little analysis mm -hmm. as I'm going forward. But when like, we had that protest, and then it continued, mm -hmm. I thought that was a strategy that would have backfired. Mm -hmm. And the reason I thought it would have backfired is because this election, you had the greatest level of undecided. And then when I looked at the poll um, that Peter um, announced, if something like 37 percent, it was mm -hmm. yeah. Labour had 47 percent of the vote of his poll. Um, UWP had 30. There was, I think, a one or three percent, and there was something like 33 percent undecided, which is a third of our population. I went back to the statistics of the 2014 election, and in the 2014 election, Labour had picked up 57 percent of the votes. The UWP had picked up. 42% of the votes. And so when we came now to 57 to 37, that was a 20% decline. 12%. So I said, that's where it was. So these were the undecided. But 2009 also had some peculiarities. Because in 2009 also, we also had some labor, I mean, some areas that were labor stronghold not voting because they were either this unhappy and too critical. Um, constituencies were Roseau South mm -hmm. and Wesley. Remember Roseau South, Ambrose George, every election was increasing his margin. Mm -hmm. He had a margin of almost a thousand votes, if not more. And so I, everybody, because even when I went to DBS, was coming in and the young journalist said, you know, Ambrose George is losing tonight. I'm like, no, 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 because um, Joshua has done so much work, but there's such a big margin. And they said, no, you have underestimated the extent to which people were unhappy with, with him and also in terms of the person who was manning his office. Mm -hmm. And then the results came, and yeah. they were correct. Wesley was thinking, because remember, the Wesley people did not want the candidate. Mm -hmm. They had said that in more ways than one. They even took out an article in the newspapers. Mm -hmm. 
And so what they did, they either did not go to, most didn't, a lot didn't go to vote, and those who went to vote did not vote the candidate. And so you, 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 you saw that happening. And so these are persons, yes, in that 12, that 42% of UWP, who would maybe have, some of it would have been labor rights, who voted against. And so you had this big mass of persons saying, okay, we need a change, and looking for the change. And waiting for a message from the opposition. Message not just of what is wrong, but also a message of hope. A message of the, the plans of doing better. And then the hope started, you know, you're not hearing it, because the message kept continuing being the same stuff. And then when the electoral reform, which is an uh, important um, element, and it was became, say, the cornerstone of the message coming down into the last week. And then, then it resorted to that, because at the end of the day, I think most people, not only are they peaceful and want peace and more peace than anything else, but I think we have to go back and stretch it to even from whence we came in 1979. Let us go back to 1979. 1979, when we had a coup led by our present president through under the guy of the CSE. Yeah, it was a coup. The change of government was a coup. It was bloodless, but it was a coup. It was a nice, it was a coup. It was a change of government outside of the electoral process. It is. And so what did we see here? But you see what was the difference? That change was generated and led by the civil servants, who was then able to gather a lot of support from the other trade unions and eventually from the mass of the, of the, of the population. This term, this change, the, the demand, the call for change, where did it come from? It came, say, from all political parties and lower down, but it was not able to stretch itself to garner mass support. So the population as a whole did not gravitate towards it. And you saw that. You, you look at the demonstration and the thing outside of this, this square. Besides the, the one when we had the, the protest about three weeks ago, it's of 8, 10, 12, 15 people who were sleeping mm -hmm. around. It wasn't a mass support. Mm -hmm. Even with the protests that we had, with the <coughs> fires, it was, what, Marigot, Salisbury, and a few other places. It did not garner the mass support of the nation. Could I, could I ask, um, in context of this? Um, if you, if I may, may, yeah. may, may, because what I'm going to say is going to piggyback Yes, yes, I'm still on that line, yes. So then, Because um, as, <clears throat> as you've been saying that it didn't garner support, but it is juxtaposed against the 1979 issue. And there's an argument that um, 1979 had nothing to do with election per se. It, it has caused an election, however, it was not motivated by an election, it was motivated by something else. And is it, is it possible that what has happened is somebody is trying to pull 1979 and, and actually torpedo it into the election process and therefore it could not get the gravity it, it required? Uh, um. and, but I've said that too. I think that's what it is. 1979 cannot be recreated. And, and I think there was also an attempt to try to tie it and recreate 1979. No, 1979 was another issue, issue. completely. Mm -hmm. 1979, yes, it was again our oh, oh, right, but it was a different kind of right, yes. where we had the thing about the Ku Klux Klan, we had the thing about making Portsmouth yes. into a free zone that we ourselves as Dominican would need a passport to get to Portsmouth for a form of identification. It was about the, 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 the this, it, was it the Broadcast Act where persons could not even speak with opposi opposition and so on. So that was a different kind of issue. The environment was different. The, 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 the leaders of the change was different. And so because that you, and, and that is why when we analyze in situations and things, it's not because something looks like it, it is the same. We have to look at it. Then people, some persons spoke and you heard it, Oh, well, we see uprisings all over the place, all over the world. Yes, we saw, we see it. But is it the same? Is it led by the same thing? So we can, we, you know, it, 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 is, it is, we can't just take a situation and then think it works. We have to adapt it to ourselves and say, how does it fit? And, and, I, and I think that that last week 
did the opposition untold harm. Untold harm. Well, I'll say something yeah. that, I mean, I, I've been paying attention to the parties for a number of years now. I hold the architects of the politics of hate and division within the United Workers Party responsible for the current situation of the party. The Scarlet Labour Party. Scarlet Labour Party. Scarlet Labour Party. Hmm. Because it was all as, as a leader, as a leader, because it was Rose's way back. Mm -hmm. So, the Labour Party and the Scarlet, I think it certainly lost. Persons wanted this change. They, 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 they felt, and I agree with you, there was this feeling for a change, even among Labour Rights themselves. They, they were never quite saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe we'll retire. However, I never got the sense that they want to work as party. Maybe that explains a large number of undecided. undecided. I don't think they wanted. Persons were fed up of the politics of walkouts, antagonism. Mm -hmm. It was just fighting. It was there, but Dominicans are not really like that. It is said Dominicans are a little too docile, too passive. Maybe that is why the the, the approach of the United Workers Party didn't win favor with many Dominicans. What also did it in for them was it seems to me at some point. Mr. Scarrett realized that for the party to continue to maintain interests, it had to revolutionize something within itself. You it may change the people, bring in new ideas, have a whole new re redo, remake new colors, etc., etc. And he actually went about and he got a number of young, vibrant persons. New ideas came in. Look, right now they have a lot of yellow in the red. So the party is beginning to look like a different party. And that is why I believe this year we saw a number of young persons, lots of young persons flocking towards the labor. So while workers they couldn't capitalize what was obvious, what seemed obvious back then to be a taste, an appetite for change, but they couldn't capitalize on that. They also were losing appeal in the eyes of people already. Already a leader was not a very pers a person with much appeal. He was seen to be a little distant. That was a handicap that he had. They could have worked with that. But they, meant they maintained the same approach, the same politics of, of confrontation. Persons are tired of that. Even their own supporters were saying, we're tired of that. It's the same thing, the same thing. I heard some of their, um, some of their most... Uh, um, fervent supporters actually saying, look, your message is confused. You, it, it, it's the same thing. Come and better than I've heard them on um, q um radio um, um, session saying so. So while uh, um, it, it might be true that there was an appetite for change, workers couldn't capitalize on it. Many workers' party couldn't capitalize on it. And Scarrett's Labour Party, they actually made some changes, which was smart, that would have made them a little more... Um, Increasing appeal, I believe, to the to the voters. Well, that's where they, they got them. In addition, of course, that 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 thing that last week there uh, there was this morning. One word was on the lips of many persons: disgusting. They will they will you, yes. Yeah, yeah. So when you say that word, I'm yeah. like ah, yeah. that was the word. Persons were pissed off, mm -hmm. shocked. Mm -hmm. Did I say pissed off? Mm -hmm. Well, yes, they were yes. vexed. Yeah. Angry, <laughs> of course. Just, I'm saying all this to persons had a, they didn't have a good reaction. And there was a gentleman, I don't know whether he's speaking the truth or not, but he said that, um, you know, this time, well, um, Awa, I cannot, I cannot deal with that. I can't deal with that. I don't want that. Because person realized that that was taking Dominic in a direction where we didn't want to go. And maybe that explained the crowds very early on this morning that was sustained up till late morning. Well, I guess both leaders urge their supporters to go to vote. Mm -hmm. But I think something else we cannot forget in that equation, if all of that, is the difference in the, in the, in the purse of the two parties. I think that two must have played a part um, in, in the results because the, the Labour purse was clearly a much, much bigger purse um, than the United Workers Party's purse. And I think to some extent that, that impacted. Um, but I always say if people really want change, no matter how much you pay them, they will make the change. Mm -hmm. I, and I really think the, the, that 
lasting was really a, um, mm -hmm. I, I, a, a coup de grace. That's, that, that, I, I that's don't know it, who that advised that, on that strategy, to be quite honest. But um, but I think we cannot, um, and maybe that is part of where campaign financing comes as, as another topic that maybe in the next term mm -hmm. that we may but have to But in our 41-year history as an independent mm -hmm. nation, um, we have seen a situation where um, the whole of the purse um, with a very tight hole and grip and, and some shown of, of strength was di di dis displaced by that very party. And I, I mean, to what extent that argument? Because we have seen both sides. Oh, no, of the I mean, that because I mean, if you take Senkit in the last election. The, 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 um, the government lost even if with even allegations of of plain loads of persons <laughs> so so yes it's that is not the only factor but it it, it does influence mm -hmm. and that doesn't mean you cannot win an election because somebody has a bigger purse than you that mm -hmm. is not the, the point mm -hmm. but having a big purse influences and can help you to navigate and influence and get a few votes that maybe you may not have been able to to get you know um and and or to or again maybe having the big size of the purse shows persons that you can then use it because i will tell you something about me personally mm -hmm. every election i get a little upset i think the campaign um campaign thing is just a little too lavish for me and i because i keep saying that is me personally yeah? I keep saying, and this year I said it even more than I have said it before. And I said, if you can get all this money to do all of these things, I, I see it as waste, to be quite honest. Because for me, I'm not going to be influenced because somebody has brought down somebody or because I have 20 vuvuzelas or whatever. I will not be, that is me, will not be influenced by that, will not influence my vote. And so I oftentimes equate myself and stretch it to others and saying, well, that should not influence too many persons. And I'm saying, okay, why if we could get all that money for campaigning, can we get some more as the state, for the state, because it's the same head, party leader, prime minister, to get some more of those same sources to fund critical areas in our economy. So the question, lies, you know, the, the question that emotes here, really and truly, is um, if you... If, if there is an accounting, and, and which is the argument that the, the opposition had put, they put an accounting. There's the issue of $1.2 million, and, and what you have seen, I'm hearing billion, billion, billion dollars. Billion. I'm, I'm hearing a similar sentiment, because um, in my understanding in politics, or in any profession or anything, there's what you call um, um, proximity. By proximity, I am your friend. You have a particular skill. I, on a motion, you participate with me. Yes, there's an accounting, but it's not all time. It is a dollar exchange. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is really. So, so yes, the bigger purse has to be defined much more clearly that it doesn't necessarily mean that any one party expended monies directly, but they had what you call proximities or, 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 or associations that they were able to expense a rather than a spend. Oh, I, oh, I, I say, agree with that. So <laughs> I, I want to see to what extent do we have those issues in that case, because uh, 19 years into power, it means that you have leverage. Oh, you must. I, I want yeah. to, I want to say must. something very quickly, though, about this whole question of money. Um, yeah, there's no question about it that the Labour Party was better financed. As, as incumbent, normally it would enjoy that. But, you know, one of the things you will find in the region is that when a government, when people want to change a government, money flows to the opposition. Mm -hmm. And I use as the example the Barbados Labour Party's campaign. Mm -hmm. Even though they were fighting against a government that was in power and was clearly well financed, mm -hmm. they, they got resources because mm -hmm. resources flow to the place where, where people, people think. think. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that's one of the challenges. Clearly, there are not a lot of people who are willing to invest in Lennox Linton. Yeah. And the other point in terms of this $1.5 billion or whatnot, mm -hmm. you know, he, he has a basic problem regarding credibility. Yeah. People don't believe yeah. him. He's like yeah. Boris Johnson. You know, you, you will say something and, and you say, you know, it's going to be it's going to be sunny today and everybody's going out with a raincoat. Th that is Lennox Linton's problem. 
he, he doesn't really have the credibility to be able to sell the idea that $1.5 billion is missing. No, 1.2. I'm sorry, $1.2 billion is missing. Mm. Right. Um, and I, 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 have, I have not met a lot of Dominicans that actually believe what he's saying. Uh, and I mean, he may very well be speaking truth. There may be some variant of it somewhere in some document. But the challenge is that if you are going to put something like that out, you have to be able to sell it as something which is believable. And mm. unfortunately, too much of what he said says does not appear believable. Um, mm. To the international press, it does. To the regional press, it does. Because a lot of people regionally are impressed with, with you know, the way that he speaks and he makes his pronouncements and whatnot. Uh, and I, you know, I've had to say to people over the last couple of weeks, you know, I said, Do you, this is, have you actually had a conversation with this guy? You know, um, I don't think that on the ground in Dominica he's taken as seriously as he's taken regionally. Uh, and I think that that says a lot. Mm. Yeah. What's your thoughts on that? Okay, the people are saying no, well, the results. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, well, I, I have already, I have already um, um, articulated my views on that. I, I Mr. Linton um, suffered, suffers from a, a certain appeal um, deficit among many persons. There was always this, it was always like that, that uh, he, he lacked mm -hmm. appeal among many, many persons. And that was a handicap. I, I, I can say I had, I had privately told a few persons who were top in the echelons, or whom I believe who had connections with the echelons of the United Workers Party, that a Mr. Linton leadership in 2013 was bad for them, and that they were going to suffer defeats upon defeats. I had told him that. Of course, I didn't expect to be taken seriously. Um, and when the 2014 elections came and they lost, I told him, well, look, I'm hoping that you're going to make a change. And then I think there was a, they had a, a, some election. He was re-elected uh, in 2019. Now he was re-elected, what, 2018, 2017. I, I told him, look, I hope you're going to make that change. He said, yeah, yeah well, well, we'll see. I said, you got to make the change. Mr. Linton, it's bad for your party because he doesn't have the appeal. Many persons do not believe that he is a, 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 an, an adequate alternative to Roosevelt's carrot. And as long as you continue to have him, you're gonna continue with that approach that you have to politics in Dominica, and you're going to lose support. I wouldn't take him, I don't think I was, I never think I'm taken seriously by, by um, I mean, when I give this idea, but I was really, really given it because of a broader picture. I think part of the problem with democracy in Dominica is that the opposition and said it once. He said it in a certain way and person like it. He said, um, I think he said, um, let's get rid um if these fellas have no use to you, what do we they, they don't do anything, um we don't need we don't need them as an opposition in Dominica. Essentially what is saying that the opposition was incompetent incompetent and pretty much absent. And that is my similar I share an, an analysis of the opposition under Mr. Linton. But what that does for democracy is it doesn't, number one, the government doesn't have a partner, a serious <coughs> partner with which it can uh, negotiate, it can battle um, logically, you know, no, no, no fighting, it can battle, and it can come to some a program yeah, for development that, that, that is beneficial to all. So the government has to go into loan. The government has gone into loan pretty much after Erica. Government has gone into loan after Maria. The government is going into loan um, with um, the resilience agenda. The opposition is absent. Its voice, when it attends these functions, uh, for example, the consultation and um, the creed. Everybody, what, 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 two or three consultations with the creed. Mm -hmm. One, I believe, is absent. Another one, I, I think I can remember is them seeing down there. But the, 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 the engagement, the interaction, is not, is not one that is going to, 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 be a, to be so rich as going to benefit the development agenda. So they have an absent. So an opposition that is bent on confrontation is going, everything for it is a fight. <coughs> Instead of looking to see, well, how it can improve, improve on what the government is putting forward. For us, that is a loss. For Dominican, that's a loss. Okay, and everything it articulates to these people is about um, 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 this side is not for you. The, the, the government hates you. I think um, Mr. Linton may have convinced persons in America that the government actually genuinely hates them. Carrot, Roosevelt's carrot doesn't love you. I mean, where, where, where is that coming from? It comes from a leader whose soul. Focus 
whose sole focus is to keep people divided so that they'll actually be angry. And hopefully, I believe he had hoped that would have worked in his favor, they would have continued to work, um, to vote, sorry, um, 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 for his party. And the, the council would have spread and more persons would have voted for his party because after all, Skerritt is a bad man. They kept on with this agenda for years and years and years ad nauseum. So let's ask. And to their detriment. Let's ask, is our, have our people, uh, our population grown? Uh, not in terms of its numbers, but in terms of its caliber, in terms of its, its, its um, receptivity to politics. Because there have been arguments um, saying that Dominicans are very political and they have been excessively political over. I've heard sentiments that persons say that in the days of Rosie and, and, um, and Mike and, and Eugenia, um, just using the, the, um, the, the local um, um, family names, just um, you would see them together, that there was some level of election yeah, kind finished of today, and there's, there's, there was that um, cordial relation, and there was more fusing, there was less amorcity between the parties. There are some claims of that. Have, have we moved? Have we... Is, is there a sense that that still exists and there's this what, dichotomy between the, the voters today that we are literally separating and we're going into down a slippery slope? What is the situation? I'll let Dr. Do Douglas start off since we, we, we missed him for a little while yeah. and okay, then I will jump in. Yeah. Well, I would tend to agree with the moderator that, that we, we, that sort of, you know, cordiality and that um, comradeliness that, that existed at the time, back then. Um, although people were in different parties, um, there's much less of that today. And, 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 and that is really, that wasn't what it was intended under the British Westminster system, which we in Dominica inherited, okay? I mean, um, we, you know, remember we were governed by Britain according to the Electronic Church um, for close to 200 years, you know, uninterrupted. And a lot of British values and the British system of government we inherited. And of course, in 1978, we got you know, independent. So even if the, we are on different parties, the, we, we are still human beings. We are still, our objective is still the betterment of the country, which the House of Assembly, the Parliament, um, is, is dedicated towards achieving. And therefore, that, that, that civility and that um, you know, informal get together from time to time and the cordiality that the moderator spoke about. Is, is healthy, you know, for the society. Um, I want to I want to put that in in another context, though. I mean, um, this thing about um, you know, Peter Wicker made a number of good points, which I I I had suspected, but he drew home very well. For example, this business about the international press buying into some of the negative views that are coming out of Dominica, um, whereas the, the the people in Dominica themselves may take a different view of those same topics, and I think probably got manifested most clearly in the OAS, who was, um, if we were not careful, would have been much, we would have been a lot of difficulty. That is why originally um, a lot of in, um, observers have been invited, but the OAS, the government was ambivalent initially, but following the presentation by Foreign Minister Francine Barron, and of course um, in, in Washington, Vince Henderson was also present, Ambassador Henderson was also present, which went down very well, and it, 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 it was able to um, to, to um, deal with some of those misunderstandings and myths and misinformation that had been out there in the international community. I think that was enormously helpful because one shouldn't underestimate an institution like the OAS, who has, which has global reach and a um, very influential entity, and to have them against you um, for, for, for misinformation reasons is really not a good thing. If there are fundamental reasons of principle, yes, but we have no fundamental differences with the OAS. It was just misinformation to a large extent outside there, in which Ambassador Francine, uh, Ambassador Vince Henderson and um, Foreign Minister Francine Barron, I followed the thing very closely, what went on and the feedback that came from the U.S. Ambassador, from the OAS um, Secretary General, and persons of that nature, the CARICOM representative at the meeting. So I think that was enormously helpful. We don't hear too much about that. You know, on the street, but those of us who follow these things very closely, you know, you see it, see it, and um, and and Peter Wickham hinted at that, but I am just turning it in a different, in a much different light, you know. So that, that so this is this is really what it is, and um and Mr. Jack mentioned, Dr. Jack mentioned, you know, about the creed. 
I mean, the credit is an enormously beneficial entity that has come on stream. And I went to some of those consultations, and really the input from the opposition was minimal. And I really didn't understand why, why that was the case, because I followed the, the invitation coming out from the cabinet secretary's office and, and, and um, the, the PS of planning. And, you know, and, you know, one should have embraced that opportunity, because the whole resilience agenda, they are central to it. And um, bearing in mind what happened to Dominica in, with Erica and Maria in particular, where a lot of the investment we made got disrupted and the, 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 the benefits that could have accrued to the economy was lost. And we had to reinvest in some of those same items and start all over again. And, you know, and this is what the resilience agenda is supposed to minimize or move us gradually away from. And for, the, for our elected representatives of whichever party to not get Play, see themselves playing a role in that, you know, is like shooting themselves in the foot. So mm -hmm. I think there, there must be, and I think that maybe the, an effort should be made to, to go back to those days. And I'm not sure how well to do it. That is not an area of my expertise in particular, but it is definitely needed. And I think the society as a whole will benefit from that kind of um, 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 feedback. I mean, moving away from confrontation, because both parties in the House of Assembly, in fact, in, in Britain, they call the opposition Her Majesty's opposition. I lived in Britain for close to two years, you know, and while I was there, I remember one of the highlights of my stay in Britain uh, was, um, was uh, actually witness a sitting of the House of Assembly when Tony Blair was Prime Minister, actually mm -hmm. followed the whole thing, you know. So, I mean, I, I got a, a good appreciation, not just what I read in, 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 the, in books on the British system of government, the Westminster system, which we inherited, like I said. In fact, all of the Caribbean islands, English-speaking Caribbean islands, have a form of Westminster system because they were former colonials of Britain from Jamaica, Trinidad, and all of them. And basically, the system of government we have is, is to a large extent similar among the islands. The, the changes are very, very minimal. And therefore, that cordiality is something that we need to go back to, bearing in mind that the objective, improving the quality of life of the citizens of the country, is the objective whether you are in opposition or you are in government. <coughs> Indeed. Well, I, um, I know persons are asking about the results, but mm -hmm. we don't have There's any. No I know there are lots of results. speculations and there may be results, but we do not have the official results. We are waiting. The last time we called results or when we got the last results from Julian. Mm -hmm. And so we have not um, received the results, though I know from messages I've received that there is a speculation or there is maybe more than a speculation. There is a expectation that the government has won, um, has retained, the Labour Party Labor has retained um, the majority and will form the new government. But I wanted to just chime in a little bit in terms of some of the things that um, both Dr. Jean-Jacques and Dr. Douglas said. And, I will, and I'll start back with, um, start off with Dr. Jean-Jacques um, in terms of um, you know, his own perception of Lennox and his likability or unlikability and so on. <laughs> Although I think while that has always been an issue and something that has plagued um, Lennox um, from the time he, maybe even before he entered the ring um, in the political fray, but I, 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 I certainly believe that there was a point where it didn't really matter, that mm -hmm. persons took Lennox for who he was, recognized him, and was prepared for that change, you know, and still, on the, yes, we still had the high percentage of undecided, but persons were going to be moving beyond Lennox and looking for the, at the bigger picture. What I, what I think happened is that somehow the party was unable to sustain that. And, and, and a few factors. One became... Something I've said, I said to people, when I went to St. Kitts, and I taught political science, so I knew that I was in Jamaica. Things were right or wrong, and people saw things along party lines. I went to St. Kitts, and I mean, as I said to people, down to the funeral homes, you went to a, you were buried based on your party affiliations and so on. But, and I used to say to them, boy, thank God Dominica is not like that. <laughs> that after an election, it's over, it's done, and we move on until the next election. Sadly, we have moved maybe even beyond St. Kitts and Jamaica in the sense of this animosity, this division that has crept into our country. Such that if you do not support, if you have a view that is different, you get called all sorts of names. You are almost harassed and harangued. And I think both parties' supporters are guilty of that act. 
And one of the things I, I keep reflecting, and I said, if we said we are democracy, and which is what we say, and so people have a right to vote, if we all support the same party, then we're going to have a one-party state. Mm -hmm. Is that what we want? The I answer is point, no. Good point, good point. And so it means we have to respect the view. You can try to influence a person. You try, try to, to show them your way, but you have to respect a person's view to hold you know, whatever view that they hold. Such that, because I always think it's counterproductive. If you f we keep calling persons all sorts of names, and then these are the same persons you expect who's going to vote for you, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 it is somehow we have to really get back to a more civil place because that civil incivility is really creeping in. It's also even impacting our children. Because I will say to you, my little boy came to me one morning and he, he determined and he declared his, um, his party allegiance. <laughs> and then he started saying to me, and you know, trying to ask me what I was and what I was and wanted to know that I had to tell him what I was, you know, he's 10. And then started saying to me, you know, thinking about that party, no, 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 it's, it's his party that is a good party, and so forth, and so on, and so on. And I was like, okay, now where are you getting that from? It is from the outside. Mm -hmm. It's imbuing that the children are buying into that. If our, we, we keep on, if we keep up this animosity and this anger that's happening, what is going to happen to our next generation of children? We have to think about it. I've said it before. I know so I got flack about it, but I'll say it again. I think part of the reason too for our, this incivility that exists is our two leaders. Mm -hmm. For the first time, I think, in our history, we have leaders who clearly do not like each other. I'm putting it nicely and say they like each other. And so at very no time or very little time do we see any sort of cordial relations between the two. And most times when there is a speaking against the other, it's nothing positive. And so if, if especially now we've gotten ourselves into such party lines, like we're going down party lines, supporters are going to buy into this. And so I think our leaders of the parties themselves need to lead by example. I think when this election is over, the results have been declared, I think the first order of business has to be the two leaders meeting to chat a path going forward. Because we cannot continue as a nation down that path we've traveled the last five years, and definitely not that path in the last year. It's not going to augur well okay, because really, our opposition a, is there's a There's a common argument, and I've heard it said uh, among many individuals that um, the former leader of the opposition is incapable of actually being at the table. And which one? Former leader, which one? Well, uh, um, Mr. Lennox Linton. Oh, oh, sorry, okay. okay. Mm -hmm. um, because I've heard the, the um, Prime Minister has indicated about his cordial, and we, and, uh, and we have seen it, uh, his exchanges with uh, Mr. Edison James when he was the leader of the opposition. We, we have seen that despite there being a difference in, in, um, in position view, and political mm -hmm. views, that at least that they were able to, to be at a table, be able to have a discussion, be able to, to communicate with each other, raise with each other, and even agree on certain um, common points outside of the, the, the public view. And um, we did not hear utterances from Mr. Edison James indicating that, but, but the Prime Minister did always allude to that. But there has been an erosion, an erosion at a very high level. And um, let's really untrue. Let's examine but the I, horns. I, I, yeah. I, I, would, I, don't, I don't think I would say that the two men don't like each other, actually. I, I, I mean... In the public, sometimes it might look that way, but I, I would, I would be reluctant to believe that, that Mr. Linton <laughs> doesn't like the PM and the PM, <laughs> Mrs. Kerry doesn't. I don't think it, it's to that point. I mean, remember the point Peter Peter Wickham made in terms of the negative publicity, especially outside the country. Yes, yes, yes. yes but I still don't think Mr. Yes, but I honestly outside. don't think PM Scarrett harbors any ill feelings towards Mr. Linton, and I don't think. 
I I would be shocked. Jared, get real is here. It, no, 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 no. <laughs> I would be. I, I hear you, but I would I would be shocked. Well, maybe shocked is strong. But I don't believe that Mr. Linton really doesn't like Mrs. Garrett. I think it is less, less, much less personal than it appears. Actually, although Mr. Linton, as in public. You know, I mean, has not said many nice things about uh, the PM, but I think that's and all vice politics. Versa. I think that's and vice versa. Well, I think that's all politics, man. That's all politics. Well, I would hope so. You know, I mean, I've spoken actually. I've spoken to both of them, um, one more than the other, and I don't get a sense that the idea of hating each other, disliking each other, is that much of an issue at all. Sometimes we actually have seen them smiling and speaking to each other in the house. We have seen them. You know. Um, Mr. Scarrett likes to throw a little jab. Mr. Linton likes to enjoy a good joke, you know, and he too can throw his things. Uh. But I think it's deeper than that, and, and the conversation is goes beyond that. I mean, there are distinctions in policy. There's a distinction in policy um, implementation and approach and 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 viewpoint. There is a. a uh, a situation where policy emerges from either one of the of the political leaders, for which one is researched, one is one is maybe piloted, one is one is one is tried out, one is one one is a replica or a, a best practice that may be adopted across the world or in the Caribbean, and then on the other hand, what do we see? What what substantive? has the leader of the opposition remove all the, the issues that has arised. What can we say that the leader of the opposition former has presented to the population that allow it to have a um, cause a change or to, to emote a change? Is, is well I'm sure yeah. well I'm sure you like No I I you know I I, I I see what the moderator is getting at, but mm. I would like to put it in a, a slightly different context because I'm saying, for example, um, in in this okay. last election coming up here, I mean, I mean, are you aware? Are you aware, Mr. Jack, of mm. the UWP having a campaign manager? I don't know, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Well, I, I personally do not. I imagine. Yes, yeah, because the thing is, I mean, those of us who know Vince Henderson. I mean, the UWP, you told me, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, so I, Vince I, Henderson was the company manager for the DLP. Mm. I mean, he's a person of tremendous capacity. I mean, I've interfaced with him enough. He, he you know, is from St. Joseph, won his seat, did his law degree, um, played a key role in getting the funding from international sources for the geothermal, quite a bit of money, about half of it is grant money. So he's a man of tremendous capacity. Mm. He played a lead role in getting Francine Barron, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, to speak to the OS in such a way that it swung them to be more balanced in their dealing with Dominica. I mean, I can point to tangible things that Vince Henderson has done that indicates to me that he, he knows what he's doing. You know what I'm saying? So, and that is a man who managed, managed the campaign. You know? so, so, the, so at this stage, we, yeah, we have so. to wrap up the discussions as we go back to the Master Studio at DBS Radio. So we'll just... Um, advise our listeners to continue listening to DBS Radio as we um, just take a break from this panel discussion. Thank you for listening to us and we hope that we can continue the discussions later on. Are we taking a, um, just a little break? Yeah, um, uh, significant break. Um, uh, what is old the four? PM is going to have. Radio, we continue coverage of the general elections 2019.
It's three minutes moving up before nine o'clock. Of course, we don't have the official results of the all the constituencies in the general elections, but we're expecting the Prime Minister to deliver an official address to the nation in a short while um, when we expect to get all the results, at least we'll have the official results from him. We'll continue to monitor the electoral office as soon as we get additional results from the various polling districts. We'll relay them to you. Celebrate, and it was 